Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, Karen wrote an angry, embellished review about me because her son had an allergic reaction. This incident happened last week, but I just found out today that she wrote an exaggerated review about me, my manager's words. It was an eight-top table, and I had seen to them for their entire meal. At the end, I asked if they were celebrating a birthday because I saw flowers, and they said yes, to which I offered our free birthday dessert. Anyone on the dessert menu, free of charge. That's how our restaurant operates. So they order a dessert along with two scoops of what we call hula pie ice cream, which is vanilla with fudge and macadamia nuts for the kids. I read it back to them and then ring it up. Several minutes later, I check in and the daughter says she doesn't like it. So I offer vanilla plain instead. This is where it got frustrating. The mom turns to me and says, vanilla is what we had ordered in the first place. I tell her, actually, I was told hula, but I can grab vanilla now for her, no problem. The mom then asks if there's nuts in the hula ice cream because the son is allergic and he's having a reaction. I say, yes, there is. So the grandparents rush him out across the street to the pharmacy. The mom says it doesn't matter anymore and not to get the vanilla for her daughter. I go tell my manager the situation and when I come back, they're all leaving except one guy. I hand him the bill and because I'm upset that they're making it out to be my fault, I tell the guy, in the future, please let your server know if there's an allergy, especially one this severe. That way we can avoid this and any cross-contamination. He says he understands and he heads out. Today, I learned that the mom wrote a review saying I knew about the nut allergy and that she definitely ordered vanilla. No, I read it back to her. I'm so frustrated, like I could have been fired if my managers didn't believe me. Take responsibility for your kid's health and make sure you let the restaurant establishment know if they have an allergy. Some review sites allow for responses. If so, your manager should make a reply and confirm that this is not the case at all. There should absolutely be a response from management if she mentioned you by name in the review. Am I the jerk for trying to get back into my kids' lives? I, 28 female, have three kids with my ex, 30 male. We were never married, but we dated while I was in college. My senior year, I got pregnant and had twins, both boys. He moved me in with him and we were raising our kids together. 14 months after giving birth to the boys, I had a girl. Immediately after, I had postpartum depression. I wasn't doing well and I decided to go back home to my parents to try to clear my head. Once home, I saw my old bedroom, my old things, and was kind of reminded of what I always wanted to do. I always wanted to take a gap year to travel but I had gotten a scholarship to my first choice school and it seemed silly to pass it up. I decided then this is what I needed to get in the right mental state. I called BD and told him I'm going to Europe for a couple months. He was incensed and tried to talk me out of it. I explained this is what I needed to go back to being myself and to be a better parent and partner. So I went. He called me the first couple of months and kept asking if I was coming back. Eventually he stopped calling. About six months in, my parents told me that he had filed to get full custody of the kids. I was mad he didn't tell me before doing it, but I thought I'd at least take full advantage and really see the world and get it out of my system. I traveled for a little over two years and visited every continent. When I was done, I really wanted to see my kids, but I felt guilty for not being present in their lives and I didn't want to face my ex. One of the friends I made in my travels offered me a gig as an English teacher in a private school in Thailand. I took the opportunity and spent the next three years doing that. This year, I returned stateside and I stayed with my parents. They showed me pictures of the kids and told me my ex let them see the kids a couple of times. I got in touch with him, telling him I was ready to be involved in their lives and he flat out refused. I threatened to sue for custody and he just replied, good luck with that and sent me pictures of me partying in Europe. They are not flattering. My parents want to see their grandkids more but they tell me it's all my fault for not being able to see them. Am I the jerk for trying to see them? Top comment. Reddit, it's my time to shine. Had to make a brand new account to not reveal anything personal. I know exactly who this person is. I know the kids and the dad. Those kids were raised by a wolf pack. When she left them, basically anyone and everyone who had a passing relation to the dad stepped up. His mom moved in for the first year to help with the babies. Neighbors, friends, and relatives all donated or bought kids stuff for them. Clothes, diapers, toys, anything he needed. One of his friends manages a restaurant and he brought them unused food almost every night. I work at the bank, so I had nothing useful to contribute other than money and time. 
One of our buddies runs an MMA gym and he has a kids class that starts after school. So he takes them in after school until their dad gets off work. Whenever the kids need a babysitter, two or three rowdy men show up ready to be horsies or punching bags for the boys and tea party guests for the girl. One of our other friends is a lawyer. He helped him gain full custody and advised him through the process. OP's parents are rich and they always offer money to help. On the advice of our lawyer friend, he always refuses. That way, they can't use that in any future custody battle. He didn't even let them introduce themselves as their grandparents, so they can't claim a relationship. Their dad is doing well now. Those kids don't want for anything. Every Sunday night, he hosts us to watch football or hang out with the kids. His daughter delights in serving everyone wheat juice. They're so much better off without this jerk. I can understand needing a break, but a couple months in Europe is already pretty excessive when you're leaving three kids. But to then hear at six months that her ex is going for custody and her response is to YOLO it for a five or six year adventure? There cannot be any possible way she rationally expected to be back in the kids' lives, especially if she contests it now and has it on record that she was spending much of it partying in an unflattering way. If the second OP is legit, at least the kids don't seem to have missed out on much. Am I the jerk for telling my stepdaughter her friend's mum is the reason her dad and I are divorcing? My husband, Jack, has been spending a lot of time with our neighbor, Sophie. It's worth noting that Jack and Sophie had an affair when she was 19. He was with his ex and she was with an ex-boyfriend at the time. Sophie is a widow as her husband passed in 2021. Jack and I also married in 2021. Jack and Sophie remained friendly after their affair, partly because their daughters were and still are friends. They've been best friends since primary school. Jack and I have been having some issues in our marriage and we've been going to counseling for the past six months. I brought up in counseling that his friendship with Sophie makes me uncomfortable because he has previously had an affair with her. Jack argued that she's just a friend and that neither of them have those feelings anymore, nor is Sophie interested in having a romantic relationship because no one compares to her late husband. That's apparently something she has said to him after he suggested setting her up on a date with a younger coworker who had expressed an interest in her. There's a lot of crossover between her job and his, which is part of the reason they remain close. In our last session, Jack admitted that he had been going to Sophie for her advice. He's been going to her to get advice about our relationship, as well as an issue with his daughter. The issue with his daughter, I understand, because it's something that Sophie has experience with, and she had a unique perspective that really did help him. The fact that they've been discussing our relationship, I don't feel comfortable with that. Jack has been really dismissive about it, arguing that it's the same as me going to my sister for advice. It's not the same. He had an affair with this woman. I recently saw Sophie in the local coffee shop and she was friendly with me, asking how I was doing and if my stepdaughter was doing better. I asked her if something was going on between her and Jack. She denied that anything was going on between her and Jack. I asked her to stop giving Jack advice because it's damaging our relationship. Sophie said that she wasn't going to stop giving her friend advice and that it wasn't her fault that I was insecure in my relationship, but that she doesn't see Jack as anything more than a friend, despite what I think. Sophie reiterated several times that she was just friends with Jack, and that she isn't that troubled teenager who had an affair with a married man anymore, and that she didn't want to implode her life again. When I got home, I told Jack that I didn't want him to see Sophie anymore. Jack argued with me, saying he wasn't going to stop seeing Sophie when nothing is going on between them. He offered to show me his texts with her, but I told him that I didn't trust him not to delete any text that he knew would upset me. Jack got frustrated and told me I was being ridiculous by accusing him of being deceitful. When his daughter came home, she was upset because Sophie had texted her daughter after our conversation and told her to come straight home as she didn't want her daughter to get pulled into what is going on between Jack and I like she had been. His daughter was angry and accused me of ruining her friendship before storming up to her bedroom, so Jack is also angry with me about it. I'm just not sure what else to do. Is there anything I can do? The fact he's constantly going to a woman he had an affair with for advice is just making me feel uncomfortable and nothing he does feels reassuring. Update. We were meant to go to a counseling session this morning. However, Jack has canceled the session and any further sessions. Jack does not want to continue counseling as he has filed for divorce. He said it was something he had been considering for a while. Apparently, when he had gone to talk to Sophie the first time, it was to get her recommendation for a divorce lawyer but she had tried to convince him that we just needed to work on our issues. Jack said that he had told her that he had lost trust in me and nothing we did was fixing it. The way I've been acting over him and Sophie also cemented that to him. 
She gave him the name of a friend who is a divorce lawyer, but told him that he was making a mistake. It turns out that when Sophie's daughter didn't come to our house as planned after school, it was because Jack had told Sophie he had planned to tell me about the divorce that evening. He backed out on telling me after his daughter came home upset, not wanting to rock the boat with her. My conversation with Sophie was just the excuse she used. If I'm honest, I still don't trust that nothing has been going on between them. The whole thing between them is weird, but my marriage is over, so what they do isn't my problem. I'm not going to fight to be with someone who lies to my face and states that they don't trust me. Update. Jack and I are getting divorced after two years of marriage. Jack has two kids, but this concerns his daughter, Ella, who's 15. The day Jack told me he wanted a divorce, we told the kids after school. Ella was upset when she found out we're getting divorced and she went to her room. She came down after tea when it was just me and her in the house. Jack and his son had gone out. She asked me why her dad and I were getting divorced and wanted to know if it was because of her. I told Ella that she and her brother are not the reason for the divorce, but that her best friend's mom, Sophie, who's 34, is. Sophie and Jack had an affair when she was 19. When the affair was exposed, Sophie's life basically imploded, while Jack's pretty much remained the same. Just as stayed, I told Ella that Jack's continued friendship with Sophie and the running to her for advice is why we're getting divorced. Ella asked if Jack was having an affair again with Sophie. I told her that Jack was denying having an affair with Sophie again, but I suspected it. She asked what I meant by again, so I told her that Sophie and Jack had an affair when Jack was married to her mom. Ella has not been speaking to Jack since our conversation. She has also lashed out at her friend, even calling her mom names and saying that she's the reason our family is falling apart. They got into a physical fight, which resulted in both Jack and Sophie getting called into school to talk about it. In the meeting, Ella told them everything I had told her the night before and blamed Sophie for ruining her family again. Jack told her that Sophie isn't the reason. Jack told Ella the reason for the divorce is because he no longer trusts me because of a mistake I had made which sent us to therapy. Months of therapy weren't able to repair his trust in me. After Jack and Ella came home, she's now not talking to me either. Jack is furious that I said anything to Ella and that I ruined Ella's friendship with her friend. Jack snapped that it was not my place to say anything to Ella. He was angry that I was still stuck on his friendship with Sophie and continues to maintain nothing is going on. He told me that Sophie's friend said in the meeting that she now wants to move to a new school where no one knows her mom is certain names that she was called and that it was my fault. Am I the jerk? Ella asked me for a reason and I told her. I do believe Sophie is the true reason as the relationship between them is weird. Update. This blew up way more than I thought it would. Both Ella and her brother were aware of the kiss. They were there when Jack was told. I referred to it as a mistake as that's what Jack refers to it as. He said that he didn't consider the kiss to be cheating because I was drunk. I've moved out of the house since I made this post and I'm now staying with my sister until I find a place of my own. On the weekend, Ella reached out to her friend and apologized for lashing out at her at school. They look like they've made up as Ella is staying over at her house this weekend. Before she left, I apologized to Ella and told her that I shouldn't have dragged her into this. Ella told me that she would never forgive me, especially for damaging her friendship, and is glad that her dad is divorcing me. I offered to pay for the girls to do something together, but Ella refused, saying she didn't want to take my dirty money. I also apologized to Jack, who told me it was Sophie who needed the apology, not him, as it was her life I had tried to ruin without a shred of evidence. I tried telling him that I just didn't believe that he and Sophie weren't having an affair, and he snapped, telling me there's nothing going on with Sophie, and she had actually started seeing someone. He found out about this because she went to him for advice as he's the only person she knows who has also lost a spouse and dated again. He then told me that he wanted me to move out as Ella had told him that she wasn't going to return home while I was still there. So yeah, I've destroyed my relationship with Jack and his kids because I was insecure. It's my own doing. I'm the jerk. OP really left out that bit about her kissing another man as long as possible. Wow. Only people I feel bad for are the kids. OP obviously is terrible, but I got so many icks from Jack's whole relationship, both former and current, with Sophie. She was 19 when they had the affair. Am I the jerk for overstepping and embarrassing my boyfriend's cousin at her birthday party? I, 21 female, have been dating my boyfriend, Ben, who's 22, for three years now. Ben and his cousin, Rachel, who's 20, are extremely close. Their moms are sisters and both single moms, so they were practically raised together. Ben usually treats her like his little sister and is very protective of her. 
but they're also just best friends and do everything together. I've known Rachel for years as we went to high school together, but we were never in the same circle of friends until I started dating Ben, which is when my best friend, Jess, and I became part of their tight-knit group. Jess and Rachel didn't really get along in high school, but have since been able to become pretty good friends. Rachel and I aren't particularly close. I like her a lot and wish we were as close as she and Jess currently are, but she doesn't seem to like me very much. I know that because she's told me off several times. One time on vacation, she told me off after Ben and I had a little argument over where to eat dinner. Rachel told me I was being whiny and annoying. She's done this in front of their moms and constantly makes little remarks when we're with friends. Ben doesn't see much wrong with it because to him, she's treating me the way she would treat a sister and he finds it endearing that she teases me the same way she does to him, which is what I try to believe as well. Last week, Ben threw Rachel a surprise birthday party. I helped him plan and we both split the cost for anything we had to buy for it. I knew from Jess that Rachel had been talking to this guy who she really liked, so I thought it would be nice if I invited him as well as our friends. Fast forward, Rachel was surprised and the party was going great. We were getting along pretty well, which made me happy. We were all drunk when the guy Rachel liked arrived with a friend. I greeted them at the door and walked with them over to Rachel in an attempt to kind of wingman for her. Rachel was talking to Jess, facing away from us, and as we got closer, we realized she's drunkenly telling Jess how much she likes the guy I invited and the friend he brought and doesn't know what to do, and then began comparing her hookups with both of them in great detail. Jess tried to get her to stop talking several times, but she was too drunk to realize, and I was frozen awkwardly as these two guys heard the entire thing. When Rachel finally turned around, she looked mortified. She went over to Ben and began telling him what had just happened. Rachel then asked him why he would even invite them, and he told her I must have invited them, since he didn't. Before I could even get any words out, Rachel began going off on me, saying I embarrassed her and put her in an uncomfortable situation, and that now she wouldn't be able to enjoy her party amongst other things. I felt so bad that I couldn't get any words out and basically just let Rachel go off on me until Jess pulled me away. Jess told me she agreed that I embarrassed Rachel and it was crappy of me to not try and stop her. I explained myself, but she said it wasn't my place to invite them to begin with since I wasn't in the loop about Rachel's love life and it would be best if I kicked them out and left as well, so I did. It's been a week since the party and Rachel hasn't spoken to me. Jess thinks I should apologize to Rachel for embarrassing her at the party. I feel bad about the whole situation, but I can't help but feel like it's unfair as I was only trying to bond with Rachel and I didn't intentionally embarrass her. I feel like I'm owed an apology as well since I basically helped plan and pay for the party and got kicked out before even being given an opportunity to be heard. Update I read through some of the comments and realized just how much there was to the situation that I didn't think about. The following took place last night. 1. I reached out to Rachel and spoke with her. I sent her a long text explaining my side of the situation and tried to clarify what had happened. I didn't apologize and I expressed my feelings regarding our relationship as well as the incident at the party. She was not very receptive and was not open to accepting responsibility over her own behavior. She said that I crossed a line and even said she believes I embarrassed her intentionally. She thinks I invited them knowing about her situation. Apparently Jess was aware of that detail and invited them both in an attempt to humiliate her as payback for all the incidents we've had in the past, basically her mistreating me. 2. I spoke to Jess as well. I reached out to her and expressed how I felt regarding her kicking me out of the party that I was essentially co-hosting, as well as how I felt towards her basically throwing me under the bus and enabling the situation between Rachel and I to get worse. She was also not receptive. I was surprised by that since we've been best friends for years and never had any issues within our friendship. It was clear she was completely on Rachel's side, and not only that, but also apparently shares Rachel's dislike of me. I spoke to Ben about everything. I told him about this post. We read through some of the comments, and we talked about the entire situation. He said he wanted to be aware of everything that was going on, so he was with me while I texted Rachel and listened to my conversation with Jess on the phone. He apologized to me for not intervening sooner, for not leaving the party with me, and also for not realizing that Rachel's behavior towards me was beyond sisterly teasing. He took full responsibility for not hearing me and not validating my concerns whenever I addressed them. He reassured me that he'll be speaking to Rachel about her behavior and setting firm boundaries, and promised to do whatever he can to make sure I feel comfortable and safe within our relationship, which was such a huge relief after everything that happened. There's something else that he shared with me yesterday too, which was honestly the one thing I was not expecting. 
Apparently, a few days ago, Ben, Rachel, and Jess were hanging out at Rachel's. He said Rachel didn't want to invite me and neither did Jess and that he found it odd that they were verbalizing that to him. What he found the most odd, though, was Jess' behavior towards him. He said he felt uncomfortable and in the moment didn't want to assume she was flirting with him but ended up leaving and after witnessing our conversation felt he should share this with me as he's starting to think there's potentially more to it. Moving on to today, literally a few hours ago, Ben came to see me and told me Rachel stopped by his place. He spoke with her and addressed everything he said he would. Her response to him was pretty much the same as her response to me. Shockingly enough though, she also told him she thinks he shouldn't even be dating me to begin with, told him she's no longer going to pretend to support our relationship and that he'd make a much better match with Jess. She ended up confessing to him that Jess has developed some feelings for him, which is what brought them closer, and she's talked with Jess about how much better suited they'd be than Ben and I. He shut it down immediately and came straight over to tell me about it. We've decided that we're going to distance ourselves from the friend group and cut ties with Jess. He's already blocked her on everything. I didn't even ask him to and left the group chat we all had together. I'm heartbroken to learn that my best friend would do something like this, but kind of starting to think she was never my best friend after all, though it still hurts to lose the only best friend I've ever had. I haven't spoken to her about this yet and to be honest, I don't think I'm going to. I don't want to waste any more energy with such awful people. Ben's been extremely apologetic and feels bad about the role he inadvertently played in all of this, as well as the way Rachel has been treating me, which to me is a good sign and has been very relieving. He's an amazing guy and I'm so happy to see that I was right in thinking that all the time. He also respects my decision to cut ties with Rachel and has agreed to discuss further what kind of boundaries we will be putting in place going forward in terms of the family dynamic. He even spoke with his mom about all of this after our talk to make sure she's in the loop regarding our boundaries as well as Rachel's behavior. She was very understanding about it and they both even insisted on paying me back what I spent on the party, but I don't want to accept because their support is more than enough. Am I the jerk because I told my sister's boyfriend he isn't a member of our family? I'm 21, male. My sister, who's 17, has this boyfriend who is always around. He acts like he lives here. They've been dating for two years, so he's gotten really comfortable with our family and our house. My little brother, who's 14, is sick right now, and it's been really stressful. When I'm not at school, I'm either at the hospital with my 14-year-old brother or at home watching my 8-year-old brother. It's been a lot. This morning, I was in the kitchen making food to bring to my parents at the hospital, when who should walk in? My sister's boyfriend. He asks me if I wanted help cooking, and I said no. He doesn't even know how to cook. He then proceeds to just stand there in the kitchen, getting in my way. I asked what he was doing, and he said he was waiting for me to be done. I asked why, and he said he was going to make something. I told him that maybe he should go to his house and use his kitchen then. He said he wasn't trying to bother me. I said that he is bothering me, and I'm sick of him always being here invading our space. I can't even relax in my own home the rare moments I get to myself, because he's always here. He said I wasn't being fair and that he's scared for my brother too and I shouldn't take it out on him. I told him to shut up, that he has no idea what he's talking about and to go home. Then he said it's important to stick together when there's a tragedy. I said yeah, families stick together, but he isn't a member of our family, so let us have a day or two a week to ourselves and leave us alone once in a while. Then he left. My sister was angry when she came down 20 minutes later. She said I'm a mean bitter jerk. She said I had no right to say that to her boyfriend and he's her guest so he can come over whenever he wants. I didn't want to fight with her so I just said fine. Was I really being a jerk though? Why is this guy always here? Update. I did end up talking to my dad. He came home and spoke to my sister's boyfriend. He told the boyfriend he needs to not come over before 11 in the morning or be here after 7 at night. He also told the boyfriend he can't use our kitchen or let himself into the house. He needs to knock and be let in. And when he's hungry, he needs to go home to get food. My dad also put my brother's games in his room and told the boyfriend not to go into anyone's bedroom he hasn't been invited into. My sister was pretty upset about all of this, especially the rule saying he has to leave by 7 p.m. My dad asked her if he's been sleeping over and she swore up and down he wasn't. I don't think that's true, but it doesn't matter. My sister's boyfriend was pretty embarrassed and apologized to my dad, saying he didn't realize he was being a nuisance. My dad said it was fine and gave him a hug. I told him I was sorry I snapped at him and we hugged it out too. So I think everyone's good and even though my sister is upset with me and my dad, my dad said she will be better off in the long run because if she wants to see her boyfriend outside those hours, she'll have to leave her room. You're the jerk. 
He was just chatting casually with you. I understand you're stressed, but he's also your sister's support person, and it's nice to see him trying to be there for you too. You kind of overreacted, but I guess it is understandable. But you're the jerk nevertheless. Not the jerk. Just because every day is totally excessive. If he was there often, I would understand, but absolutely every day shows that he's absolutely oblivious of your boundaries. I can't imagine coming back from the hospital after visiting your sick brother and never having the space to cry or let it out. Every day is just too much. Not the jerk. It's okay that he's comfortable, but he's crossing the line when he doesn't give you the space you need around the kitchen and such. Now, one thing to consider, since your sister is 17, I assume he's 17 as well. He's very immature still. Am I the jerk for making my husband a vegan dinner, even though he's completely against becoming one? I, 24 male, and my husband, 25 male, have been happily married for a little over a year now. We met through a mutual friend and he learned very quickly that I'm vegan. About a year after we met and got closer, we started dating. He had no issues with me being vegan, but made it very clear that I couldn't force him into becoming one as well, which I respected. I haven't ever put him down for eating meat in front of me, as that's his choice. To each their own. We even served both vegan and meat-inclusive food at our wedding to accommodate both of our families. Up until now, everything was great. However, recently, I've been seeing a ton of vegan recipes on my Pinterest and decided I wanted to try making one for dinner. We don't usually end up getting to have fancy dinners at home as both of us work full time, but I found some time today to cook something up. It was a recipe for pulled pork sandwiches, but the pork wasn't actually pork. Instead, it was jackfruit. He seemed a little stressed about work, but I showed him the surprise dinner and that seemed to help his mood out. He ate it happily and even complimented my cooking. But when he asked me what was in it, and when I told him it was pulled pork sandwich with jackfruit as a meat alternative, he lashed out. He shouted, telling me that he made it clear he was staying a meat eater. I tried explaining that I wasn't trying to turn him into a vegan, but he had just walked away then. This happened a few hours back, and now he's refusing to talk to me. I feel like I might be the jerk for making him a vegan meal, even though he had made it extremely clear he wouldn't become one, because even if it wasn't my intention to make him one, I still made a vegan dinner that passed off as one with meat in it. So Reddit, am I the jerk? Edit, this is a pretty commonly asked question, so I'll just clear it up. I didn't say it was pulled pork sandwich. All I had said was that I made some sandwiches for us. Nothing more and nothing less. I don't understand people like this who love food until finding out that it's vegan. You're not pushing veganism on him. You made a meal that you could eat and that he ended up enjoying. I don't see the issue. I don't eat dairy, so I use plant-based milks, butters, cheeses, etc. My husband doesn't care as long as it tastes good. I also make vegetarian and vegan meals at least once a week just to take a break from meat. As a big meat eater, he also doesn't care about that as long as it tastes good. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. Eating a single vegan meal does not make you vegan. That's like saying that I'm a fitness enthusiast because I went to the gym once last year. Entitled coworker tried to hijack our wedding. Hey Reddit, was listening to a Bridezilla story and it reminded me of something that happened when my wife and I were planning our wedding in 1992. My wife is the anti-Karen, the anti-Bridezilla. Backstory. On our first date, she fanned out a stack of restaurant coupons and said, where do you want to take me? We picked Pizza Hut. Her engagement ring is a heart-shaped amethyst with two little diamond chips. I bought it at Kmart. She cherishes it. Her wedding dress did not come from a bridal shop. It came from the Sears catalog. It's a very simple white and cream dress. It would not be out of place at an afternoon tea party. I bought my three-piece navy pinstripe suit since I needed a suit anyway. We wore the same clothes with different accessories to a costume party as a 1920s gangster and his wife. We had the wedding at our church. Our pastor was the real deal. He blessed the rings, and when he handed them back to me, they were ice cold. We exchanged the old wedding vows. A couple of my buddies found out at the last minute that they could make it, and they showed up. After we said our vows, they pulled out swords and made an impromptu arch for us to walk under. My wife's friends were upset and started yelling, Nobody told us to bring our swords. Yeah, major fantasy geeks on both sides of the aisle. 32 years together, 31 years married this October. Next anniversary, I'm going to take a page from my granddad and raise a toast to five years of wedded bliss. When my wife announced our engagement, one of her coworkers, not even a friend, apparently got wedding rabies. She was so happy and went over the top offering to help. My wife was doing the tiny amount of wedding planning that was needed as her maid of honor lived in New Jersey. We're in upstate New York and had two kids to look after. 
Coworker insisted that it wasn't fair to my wife that Maid of Honor wasn't doing the wedding planning. She kept trying to insert herself as the wedding planner. Nice of her to offer, but she wanted to arrange our wedding the way she wanted it. No, we did not want any of the nonsense she kept suggesting. Coworker, not knowing my wife well, of course had zero clue what our tastes were. My wife's maid of honor was already making custom silk flowers for us and the tables as a wedding present. I think Coworker was delusional enough to think that she could weasel her way into being maid of honor. My wife kept politely but firmly shutting her down. Last straw was when Coworker called me to tell me about the surprise bridal shower she was throwing for my wife so I could get her there. Oh no. First, my wife was already going to have a bridal shower at our house. Father-in-law and I went down to the fire hall and watched baseball. Second, my wife hates surprise parties. Third, my wife would never have picked that restaurant. An overpriced steakhouse is the absolute last restaurant we would ever pick. Fourth, who the heck was coworker planning on inviting? She didn't know any of my wife's friends. Wife shut that down hard. She immediately called coworker and told her off. No meltdown, no yelling, no screaming, no language or insults. Just pure anger, as hot and bright as a welder's torch. Cue tears from coworker. Boo hoo, I was just trying to help. Nope, denied. We joke that you need to keep my wife away from breakable objects when she's angry. Cities, mountain ranges, that kind of fragile stuff. Drama over and the wedding happened. Karen complained to the restaurant manager to make me move tables, ends up getting arrested. So this just happened and I'm pretty upset about it. I went to California Fish Grill for a late lunch. It was a pretty standard ordeal. I ordered my meal, grabbed a drink, and made sure to grab a small table with only two seats so I wouldn't take up too much space. Not that it really mattered because the restaurant was fairly empty with plenty of tables. As I'm casually sitting at this small table for two, an older lady came up to me and asked me to move. I was a bit puzzled because she came in after me. The table I was at appeared to be untaken and there were plenty of other available seats. I asked why and she said she wanted a table big enough for her and her son. At this point, I told her I wasn't going to inconvenience myself when there were plenty of other open tables. She could simply go sit somewhere else with her son. So she started getting frustrated with me and telling me I needed to respect my elders and that her son would not be able to sit at another table. I just ignored her though because it wasn't my problem. So this lady walks off and tells the manager that I took her table and was refusing to give it back to her. She brings the manager over and explained that her son is very upset that I took their table and it was hurting his feelings. We had a few minutes of back and forth before the manager gives me this look of, I don't make enough money to deal with this, please just move. So whatever, I get up, go to another table and this lady just glares at me. I glare back and she's sitting all by herself. At first, I thought she was just a liar and didn't even have a son. Maybe she just wanted to misuse what little power she had. After like 10 minutes though, this guy walks in with a full suit and tie, maybe 40 to 50 years old, and approaches this lady and calls her mom. They exchange some words and he starts glaring at me too. At this point, I'm just annoyed and trying to eat my lunch in peace. So her son, a grown man, shouts at me from across the restaurant and asks if I think it's funny to disrespect his mom like that. And I just look at him puzzled because I have no idea what he's talking about. He shouts again, yeah, you in the hat. So I just ignore him because this is stupid. As he continued to harass me, I decided to give him a signal he did not appreciate. This lady and her son lost their crap, got up yelling and screaming and generally causing a scene. The son started threatening to beat me up. He asked if I liked being such a smarty, so of course, I had to let him know it was better than being a dummy. Anyway, this commotion resulted in the police being called by the manager. They showed up after an unclear amount of time, walked right up to this lady and her son and asked them to leave. The lady starts going off about how I stole her table, I was harassing her and how I started it. Now this poor police officer looks down at me, casually sitting at my table, eating my salmon and tells this ancient woman that I don't seem to be bothering anyone. So the lady signals out the manager, hoping that they would corroborate her story and the manager explains in great detail that this woman had come in and started harassing me. She asks the woman and her son to leave and they both refuse because they paid for their food and said they had a right to sit at any table for as long as they wanted. After refusing to leave, this jerk and her son were cuffed and escorted away. 
I made sure to move to her table as soon as she left, just to rub the salt in the wound. Am I the jerk for leaving Thanksgiving dinner at my mother-in-law's house after I discovered that she threw out the dish that I brought? I, 27, female, am 5 months pregnant. I have pre-existing health issues that I manage by having a diet with no meat of any sort. This has caused me and mother-in-law to have conflicts, especially when I refuse to eat the food that she makes. I used to either come and not eat anything or just stay at home. Since I'm pregnant, I could not attend Thanksgiving and not bring food with me out of respect for mother-in-law. I cooked a small meal and brought it with me. Mother-in-law made a fuss about it, but justified it as, I was making a mistake robbing her grandbaby of getting all the meat benefits. I explained that I take supplements as a replacement, but she shrugged and was upset. We waited till the dinner table was set. Mother-in-law didn't let me help or go into the kitchen at all. She took my dish and said she'd reheat it for me and put it on the table. Yet when I sat down, I was stunned to have discovered that she did not put my dish there. When asked publicly, she denied receiving any dish from me and started asking if I accidentally left it at home or the car. There was a huge blow up. Mother-in-law tried to convince me to sit back down and just eat what she put on the table. I refused, but my husband insisted and told me to let it go this time. I decided to leave. I grabbed my stuff and walked out. I found out that she threw out the dish I brought and tried to get me to just eat whatever she put on her table. She said that she was looking out for my grandbaby's health and my husband said it wasn't worth leaving the celebration and causing a scene. We had a big argument and his mom thinks I'm being dramatic and hard to deal with. Was I the jerk for walking out? Info. The dish I brought was supposed to keep me full and provide me with all the benefits, so it wasn't like any of her appetizers or side dishes. I also put work into making it and it cost me money. She keeps insisting it's about her grandbaby and her concern for their health. Not the jerk. I've been in your shoes. Tell your husband to defend you or you're out. Things will only get worse. She's going to force you to raise that baby her way and your husband is going to let her do it. The gaslighting from her is especially scary. Literally, tell your husband straight out that he either be 100% on your side from now on for everything or you're leaving him. Do not put up with that. It will ruin your life, your marriage, and your kid. Maternity wear. This happened several years ago. After onboarding a new job, I was told I could hire an assistant. The HR director, Kelly, handed me a stack of resumes, told me about a friend's daughter, and bumped Kat to the top of my interview list. Kat passed the tech test with high scores and interviewed well, so I hired her. Kat showed up to work on time, had a good attitude, performed well on assignments, and was generally a pleasant person all around. After probation, Kat was excited to tell me that her last raise was enough to get an apartment with her boyfriend. It was a couple months after her raise, I started to notice Kelly spending an inordinate amount of time talking to Kat. The conversation sounded personal and cordial, and Kelly was friends with Kat's mom, so I didn't think much about it. Until one day, Kelly barges in my office. Did you know Kat moved into an apartment with her boyfriend? Well, I might have heard something about that. Well... Kat is pregnant and her mom is devastated and proceeds to fill me in on the details of Kat's personal life. Uncomfortably, I interrupt, acting like I have a lot going on. Uh, this really isn't any of my business. If there's something related to Kat's performance that we need to discuss, please fill me in. But as for me, Kat is doing a great job. A few months pass. Kat's baby bump is starting to show. Kelly is again in my office. Kat is not in compliance with the dress code. Last staff meeting, Kelly handed out a dress code policy with a collage of various women's shoes and dresses and suits, presumably cut from fashion magazines, to assist us determine what was acceptable and what was not. Is she wearing something in the not allowed clippings? As I began to spread the clip art around my desk, she isn't wearing maternity clothes, as Kelly points to the bullet about maternity clothes in the policy. Well, the policy clearly says maternity wear is allowed. Kat is clearly pregnant and she is wearing clothes. So, you know what I mean when I say maternity clothes? Clothes from a maternity store. I told Kelly that I would talk to Kat, which I did. Kat filled me in that there was some drama with her mom not liking her boyfriend, that Kelly is involved, etc. I just told her to read the policy and be sure she complies, and no matter what, to trust me. I had her back. The next day, Kelly is in my office, telling me that Kat is again not in compliance with the dress code, at this point, Kelly knows I'm getting frustrated. 
Okay, I'll talk to her again. This time I want you present because I'm going to give her a formal warning and assign remedial training. I bring Kat into my office with Kelly present and formally read off my prepared statement, making it clear that it will go into her permanent file. Kat, you were given a verbal warning yesterday to comply with this dress code. Because it is not clear to me what is or is not a violation of this policy, you are to report to the HR office 10 minutes early every morning for the next two weeks for dress code inspection. Report to me if HR finds your dress unfit. If you are found to be in violation of this policy and are unable to correct your dress before the start of the workday, your employment will be terminated. By the time I'm finished, Kat is tearing up and Kelly is staring at the floor, speechless. I dismiss Kat. I hope that this is the last I hear about this, because if I do, I'll fire her. As Kelly, speechless, walks out of my office. I told Kat not to worry about any of this. We have them where we want them. So for a week, Kat reported to me that her clothes were fine per HR inspection. At the beginning of the second week, she was chuckling. Kelly told me that I looked very nice today. Attitudes began to change and everyone was smiling. I got called to the red carpet by Jim, the CEO. He tried to keep a straight face as he recited what he heard was going on and asked me to cut the remedial training short because it was embarrassing the HR staff. Straight faced, I said. Well, Jim, if I stopped the remedial training, I'd have to fire Cat. Company policy clearly states that failure to complete a formal remediation plan is immediate termination. It is very clear. There is zero tolerance. You can't fire a pregnant woman for what she wears. I'm asking. No, I'm telling you to stop. Stop following a company policy? Laughing, he concedes. Okay, I am rescinding that ridiculous dress code policy effective immediately. Am I the jerk for not adding a third bathroom to our house? My husband, our daughters, 18, 16, 16, and 12, and I live in a four-bedroom, two-bathroom house. All of the girls share a bathroom, and they've been complaining about it for a while. We've been saying we'll convert the laundry room into a bathroom for the twins for a while. It's an expensive project, so we've never gotten around to it. My husband and I started working on our garage recently and turned it into a gym for him, a new laundry room, and an office for me. Then we came into some money and decided to renovate both bathrooms, remodel the kitchen, and do work on the backyard. The girls were upset when we told them about the work we were doing on the house. They were saying it's not fair that my husband gets a gym when the twins share a room and that we chose to work on the backyard instead of adding the third bedroom. They've been calling us selfish and even got our parents and siblings to give us a hard time for not giving them another bathroom or giving the twins their own rooms. They don't understand that now that the laundry room is done, we have the space for the bathroom. The bathroom is next on our list. I wanted to get some outside opinions on this since our kids and our families have been giving us a hard time. You're the jerk. Does going without a home gym diminish the quality of life? No. Does forcing four humans to share one source of plumbing diminish quality of life? Yes. You're the jerk for springing for a luxury instead of choosing to make life easier for your kids. Editing. Because I keep getting the same comment over and over from people saying something along the lines of, How dare you? I live in a house of six or nine or twelve people and we share a fraction of a bathroom. You are spoiled and icky. And I'm really tired of pinning the same response over and over, so I'll just say it here. 1. I grew up the youngest of five. I shared a bathroom for 18 years with siblings. 2. I share an apartment with a few folks, and we share one bathroom. 3. My point is that, if I had a bunch of money lying around, I'd spend it to make the lives of my kids a bit easier, rather than on something frivolous. 4. For all of you crying out, entitlement, luxury, ugh. Please take the time whilst you redden your faces in rage at the prospect of two people sharing a bathroom instead of four, to also take your energy to defend OP's choice to redo the existing bathrooms, redo her kitchen, add a new gym, and redesign her backyard. 5. You all like to skate over the fact that OP lied to her kids about a new bathroom and has presumably been doing so for a while. There are four of us in our home and we share one bathroom and all have the smallest bedrooms you can even imagine. If I came into some money, the first thing I would do is extend to give my kids more space in another bathroom. There's no way I'd be adding a gym, a second laundry room, and whatever else until I made my kids more comfortable. You're the jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? 
please let us know. First world problems for the win. Don't want to total my late model car? Okay, I warned you. Two years ago, I hit a warthog-sized raccoon on my way home from work. I was driving an 09 Suzuki SX4 hatchback. The raccoon did a pretty good bit of body damage to the front bumper and wheel well. The estimate to repair it was $2,200. I giggled at the adjuster when he said the insurance company was approving the repair instead of totaling the car. He insisted it was work just under $5,000 so it should be fixed. I told him that having owned the car for a decade, it's not easy to get certain parts since Suzuki closed their US business. He insisted. Insurance provided a rental. It ran $800 a week. Had a rider for a better rental. So four weeks go by. The car isn't repaired. The shop can't find a wheel well to finish the job. Adjuster calls, a bit mad at me that I wasn't pressuring the body shop. I reminded him that I have insurance to make me whole and that's not my job. The repairs were a bit more expensive than anticipated. $2,500 in repairs plus lockdown cleaning fee of $200 equals $2,700 plus $3,200 for the rental. They had now spent more than the alleged value of the car. So, no, the adjuster insists the car is drivable without the wheel well while he finds the part. I offered that that was a stupid idea and it's there to protect the engine compartment. He insists. Okay, I drive it. My work is 30 miles away. I drove it through a snowstorm with no wheel well. The snow was thrown into the engine compartment. Immediately in front of the affected wheel is the battery, fuses, and computer. They were all absolutely caked in snow, salt, and ice. Now all the dash lights are going off randomly and the car is shutting itself off. I called the adjuster and told him that driving without the wheel well has likely ruined the computer, fuse box, and battery. I asked which shop has a contract with them to fix these issues. Big sigh on the other end. Pregnant pause. Well, I think we've spent enough on this car. We'll just total you out. It's probably only worth 2000 so that's what I'll pay you. Nope, you said just under 5000 That's what I want. They wrote me a check for $4,700. All in all, I figure they spent about $10,000 on a vehicle worth at best 5000 I would have accepted $3,000 or less if they had offered it originally. Am I the jerk for not comping the bill? I, 20 female, have been working in the restaurant business since I was 14. I've seen numerous amounts of people come and go, both customers and coworkers. I became a server about four years ago at this local small business and I thought I had seen how far people really take things. About five months ago, I had a party come into my restaurant with two adults and three kids. They sat down in my section and I already had a bad feeling about them. At first, when I went to start them off with drinks, one of them was on the phone, but both of the adults completely ignored me. So I asked again and the kids started screaming out drinks. So I asked if it was okay if I brought those out and the mom said, sure, whatever. I asked her again what she would like and no answer. I brought the kids their drinks and the adults waters just in case. When I dropped them off, they then asked if they came free with kids meals. I told them yes, as long as they bought kids meals. I then left them alone for a few minutes to look over the menu. So I went back about 5 minutes later and told them that the kitchen will be closing in about 20 minutes just so they aren't blindsided. They ordered then and I continued on serving others and cleaning up for closing. I brought out their food and they started eating. Mind you, they got a meal for each kid so drinks were free since they all got fountain drinks and the adults got two meals each plus two drinks each, drinks they asked other servers for, thinking I wouldn't add it to their check. So I went to check on them halfway through, and they said they didn't like the food, so I asked if something was wrong with it. It was half eaten. They told me, No, we just don't like it, and I wanted to try it, for both of their second meals. I said, Okay, so would you like me to throw it out? They told me yes, so I did. The meal went on, and I dropped off their checks, and I knew they were going to have an issue with it since I hadn't taken off the meals. As they were calling me over, they asked why I hadn't taken it off, and I told them I didn't have the manager's code in order to do that, even though I did. They asked for the manager, and she also told them that, we don't take food off if you just don't like it, and they weren't very happy with that answer. Then they complained that I pressured them to get more food, as if that's not my job, so they threatened to walk out, screaming, I'm not paying for this crappy food. Okay, fine, call the police on me, 
and you're making me look like the bad guy in front of my kids. So we called the police, they were forced to pay by the officer, and they were trespassed. She called her husband, and he started threatening me and my coworkers. This went on for days by him. Should I have just comped the check rather than starting a fight? Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. This is a scam they pull over and over again to get food without paying for it. Maybe they'll think twice about it next time, and they certainly won't be coming back to your restaurant anymore. You did your colleagues and your industry a favor. Am I the jerk for using a map to show my neighbor how big our state is? I, 34 female, live in southern Arizona. I have a new neighbor, an Irish woman who's in her 30s, who recently moved here with her American husband. They moved into the apartment next door about a month ago. Before that, they lived in New England where the states are much, much smaller. Comparison for anyone who has never thought about it. The state of Massachusetts from north to south is the same distance from Tucson to Phoenix. I'm single and my neighbor's husband is out of town for a couple of weeks for work, so she thought it would be fun to take a day trip to show her around the area. Great. She wanted to start at the Grand Canyon. Not great. Then she thought it would be nice to pop over to Las Vegas for lunch. Oh no. I tried to tell her that she had picked places that are much further apart than she thinks, but she insisted it couldn't be that bad. So I pulled up Google Maps and showed her just how far we were talking about. That if we drove from here to the Grand Canyon, it would be 7 hours if we never stopped for food or gas, then 4 hours from the Grand Canyon to Las Vegas, and that's not even counting the drive home. It's not an easy, fun day trip. After seeing the times, she now believes me about the distance, but she says it was rude to pull up a map to show her. She says that if she wasn't getting what I was saying, it's my fault for explaining it badly, and that using Google to show her is just a jerk move to treat her like she's stupid or like she's a kid. I suggested a few places closer to us, but she yelled that, You better look up a map to make sure it's not too far first, and went back into her apartment. I really didn't mean to upset her, and I definitely don't think that she's stupid. I just didn't know how else to get her to believe me that the trip she wanted to take wasn't possible. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Showing her a map is a perfectly logical and respectful way to demonstrate the distances and time involved. I do it all the time when I want to find driving distances for myself. Her reaction seems childish. She disagreed with what you told her, so you showed her hard evidence. She should have given you more respect since you lived there longer than her and were likely to already know better. And once you backed up your point, she should have just conceded. Karen Boss ruins our workplace, ends up losing her career. The Red Queen was number two in our office, a person who rose through treachery, backstabbing, personal connections, and incompetence. You know, the typical way a manager moves up. She spent 27 months as a line worker before deposing her supervisor in a coup. In this industry, it usually takes five years to get to a point where one really knows what they're doing. She then attached herself to an office boss known as Dan the Dirty, doing his hatchet work on employees and so became indispensable to him. So when Dan the Dirty came to our office, he dragged the Red Queen with him. It was a three-month honeymoon where the office was being inspected, so she kept her fangs hidden. The day after the inspection report came out, it was open season on the staff. The report did say that it was a very productive office. Well, several things came out within days. This was before we had electronic time cards, so she wrote up a 17-page rambling procedure on how to log your time. AL staying in town was one color, going away was another color. SL for yourself was one color, your male spouse was another, female spouse another, kids another, etc, etc. We had more colors than a Crayola 64 crayon box. Also, you had to log time by the minute, in spite of the fact that the system only took 15 minute increments. People were taking 21 minutes of leave and signing out at 519. It drove HR insane. In the procedure, if you came back from coffee after 15 minutes or lunch after 45, you were on leave. You could only take lunch between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. unless you had express written permission in advance from her. We're a 24-hour organization. People on the night were getting daily written authorization from her merely to eat. I was away on assignment in a time zone six hours different and had to get written authorization from her to eat for my entire team on a daily basis because we never ate between 10 and 2 for that time zone. You also had to sign in at exactly 8 and out at 5. Again, we're a 24-hour organization. 
The Red Queen also developed office and unit spies who would report you if your coffee break went 16 minutes. The office spies were also reviewing your email and your time cards to ferret out any malcontent or color violators. As you can imagine, this did wonders for trust and morale. This is one of about a hundred insane things that she did. Here's the malicious compliance. One type of log entry on your time card was doing the time card. Huge swaths of employees began putting doing the time card on their time card. So your entire day could be doing the time card. Night shift employees began to only work between 8 and 5 and all night productivity stopped. It wasn't long before productivity ground to a halt in the office and panic began to take hold in the ivory tower. Unfortunately, the Red Queen countered by doctoring the records and cooking the books to make it look like we were still being productive so that headquarters wouldn't catch on so she survived for 22 months before the office was on the verge of mutiny. I mean, why actually be productive when you can work 10 times harder to destroy productivity and make it only seem like you're being productive? But word did get out and an inspection was scheduled. In a move befitting Game of Thrones, the Red Queen threw Dan the Dirty under the bus and fled to a Connecticut office before inspection and then utterly destroyed that office. I wrote one of many letters to headquarters saying that Westeros had nothing on our organization and that a day in the office was like an episode of Game of Thrones, only with less blood and more paper. It all eventually caught up to her. The very head of the organization threw her out, but not before she destroyed one office and nearly destroyed three others. Last I heard, she was doing data entry in Colorado somewhere. Am I the jerk for kissing my husband at a friend's event? I, female 37, and my husband, male 42, attended my friend Becky's, female 36, annual barbecue last weekend. Becky and I have been close friends since college. I met my husband shortly after graduating, and while him and Becky have never been very close, such as hanging out without me, they have always been friendly towards one another, and we've all hung out together on numerous occasions. Becky recently lost her husband due to a medical issue. This year, Becky texted me the day before her event and told me that she was making this year's occasion a child-free one, and that meant I couldn't bring my three-year-old and that she understood if I couldn't make it. I bit my tongue in an effort to be respectful and thanked her for letting me know and told her I indeed wouldn't be able to make it. She responded by saying she was looking forward to seeing my husband at dinner though. I saw no issue with this and sent her a thumbs up. The next morning was the day of Becky's event and my mother-in-law luckily agreed to babysit our toddler. We thanked mother-in-law and headed over to Becky's with food, gifts, and no kids in tow. As we walked in, Becky greeted my husband with a hug and an excited, hello, and then turned to me with a sort of surprised look on her face. She didn't say much to me and went into her living room with everybody else. I went to put down the food on the counter while she introduced everybody to my husband and referred to him as dear. My husband told me this later on in the evening. I walked into the room and she gave me no mind since she was deep in a conversation with a friend of hers. Sometime into the party, Becky and my husband were both standing at the patio door and she had her arm around his waist. He spotted and looked at me with a help me glare, so I made my way over thinking she had one too many. I gave him a kiss as he separated from her grasp. Becky looked at the both of us and then back at the others at the party with a shocked expression and then ran back into the house crying. She ran into the bedroom and locked the door and screamed at me to leave through the door. I tried asking her what had upset her and why she wanted us to leave numerous times. She refused to answer me and just kept crying. So we left and on the way out received some pretty dirty looks from the other partygoers. Later, I received texts from several mutual friends who scolded me for PDA and how Becky was so upset that I had made her party look tacky and that I was rubbing it in her face that she was a widow. I was so shocked and hurt to hear this and mentioned that every other couple at the event was also being relatively affectionate, and that despite my husband and I not being ones to commit PDA in public, I had given him a side hug and a peck kiss, and that was all. Anyways, I am at a loss at what I should do. I feel like I hurt a close friend, but I'm not sure how and what I can do to fix it. Reddit, help. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I mean, it's so obvious she was hitting on your husband. She's probably embarrassed and humiliated. OP should text her a fake apology. I'm sorry you got upset, but you see, 
Husband signaled me to come kiss him because he felt really trapped by you clinging to him. Then write off the friendship because it's already over. I called my stepdad pathetic and my entitled mom spineless on Thanksgiving. I'm 19, female, and using a throwaway because my siblings use Reddit. I know it sounds bad, but here's the gist. I've got two siblings, 15, female, and 17, male. And while I lived in mom and stepdad's household, currently at university, I was tasked with most chores. Washing dishes, doing laundry, cleaning, running errands, you name it. While my siblings had none. Their reasoning? You're older. I protested this many times, telling them my siblings were old enough to also share the chores. But stepdad always shouted me down and called me ungrateful after he put a roof over my head and fed me. That's been a line he's thrown at me endlessly. My siblings have been given anything they want, allowance, gifts, electronics, but if I asked for something, I was told I didn't need it. That's why I started babysitting at 12, so I could buy my own goods. I've worked ever since. They stopped buying me basic goods, like sanitary products, as soon as I started working. I'm at university on a full scholarship because I knew early on I'd be on my own on this front. I worked my butt off to get into my top choice. I love it there. I feel free and in control of my life. The issue came during dinner. Mom, stepdad, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins were there. I was talking to an aunt who'd congratulated me on getting into my university and stepdad says loudly, OP thinks her fancy college makes her better than everyone else as usual. I can't explain what was different this time, but I snapped. I told him he was pathetic for picking on me all my life, when all I'd done was try to be a good kid. And I told my mom she was spineless for letting him treat me this way. And I left. Which felt like the right thing to do at the time. I slept at a friend's and got a train back to university the next day. My mother has since called me distraught, like full on sobbing, saying I was being overdramatic and that I humiliated them. She says that I'm ungrateful because, look at how well you're doing, that's because of us, and I just don't know. I feel bad she's this hurt, people have it worse, I'm doing well, I have a family to come home to, I just don't know, am I being dramatic, am I the jerk? Update 1. I can't tell you how validating these comments have been. I never talk about my family in real life because deep down I think I feel ashamed of how my family treats me. So this has been helpful, really. I don't have it in me to tell them what I need to tell them outright, but I do have it in me to go no contact. They don't fund any part of my life, so the only thing they can hold over me is themselves. I'm writing an email now to let them know not to contact me and that I won't be contacting them until I'm ready to communicate. 2. Brother texted, Mom won't stop crying. Hope you're happy. Sister texted, This sucks. So there's that. I love my younger siblings, but I'm going no contact with them as well before I figure out what I want. Thanks for the support. Not the jerk. OP, your mother is spineless. She has allowed for you to be treated as less than for being a stepchild. She allowed for you to go without for the sake of peace. You are not overdramatic and deserve better. Keep in contact with those who truly value you and move on. If you want to tell your mom your feelings before doing so, go ahead but she will not be open to what she has done in order to protect herself from facing her neglect. That is not on you. Your siblings suck too for never speaking up for you. Go make your own family, not the jerk. Karen gets kicked out on Thanksgiving. I, 27 female, have a kind of unusual profession in that I run a wildlife sanctuary and rehab center of wolves, coyotes, and birds of prey. Mostly animals that have been surrendered or taken away from private owners or just can't go back into the wild for some reason. I started working for the previous owner out of college, and when he passed, he willed the center, the house, and the surrounding land to me to take over since I was the most dedicated and successful at doing the work. Since I have a weird situation with my own family, he was also kind of dad number two to me, so I miss him a lot. My family situation is weird because my parents split up when I was little, had other kids with other partners, and then they remarried when I was 16. So I have four half-siblings, and they all resent me because my parents getting back together meant that theirs split up, and my parents have always been way more attentive to them to make up for it. So I got the worst of both situations, being the unwanted first marriage kid when they were divorced, and then the ignored kid because of the half-siblings later. I don't really stay close or visit much, partially because I need to be on site to take care of the animals, but I keep in touch. So for the drama. Now that some of the siblings are getting married and having kids, 
My parents' house is too small for big gatherings. My house is the only one big enough to fit everyone, so my mom asked if we could do Thanksgiving at my place. I was reluctant, but I figured maybe it would clear the air some, so I agreed. Plus, the kids would get a kick out of the menagerie. Things were going fine until my sister, 21 female, showed up and started making jokes about how I've taken crazy cat lady to the extreme and getting the other siblings to chime in. I tried to ignore it, but the jokes got meaner. And when my mom said she liked the house, my sister said, Maybe I should get an older sugar daddy. It worked out well for OP. I snapped and told her to get out. She didn't believe me, so I got up, took her plate, grabbed her bag from the living room, and told her to leave. It probably helped that my big rescue wolf dog heard my tone and came over to sit next to me, but she finally got up and started angrily getting her things. My parents protested, so I told them they could go too. After an argument, a threat to call the cops if they weren't gone within an hour, and my dog hackling up and growling when my brother put his hand on my shoulder, they finally left. Now they're mad because I ruined Thanksgiving for everyone. The kids were scared. I sicked my pet wolf on them like a psycho and overreacted to a joke. I feel bad for the kids. Maybe I should have just taken it on the chin and not invited them back instead of kicking them out. Not the jerk. Your house was full of unruly beasts howling like absolute monsters and also your rescue animals. Good riddance to your crappy siblings. Do yourself a favor and drop them from your pack. They aren't good people for you. Family should be those who build you up, not tear you down. Not the jerk. If you viewed the man who willed his house and sanctuary to you as a father and someone who truly cared about you, then having him called a sugar daddy with all the implications with that, then you have a right to kick them out. That's rude and just downright awful to say to you after being nice enough to host and have everyone, especially knowing the relationship between you and your siblings. Not the jerk. Your sister was bullying you right at the table and getting others to chime in. What were you supposed to do? Just sit there and take it in your own house? I also would have kicked them out. Tell your parents all of this, and if they don't listen, it's on them. You can wipe your hands clean of the situation. Am I the jerk for not allowing my cousin's stepkid in the family photo? My, male 30s, family grew up taking a big Thanksgiving picture that is used for Christmas cards. I kept the tradition going with my family. We host Thanksgiving every year and it's always around 20 plus people. Most families we hang out with are from my wife's side since mine are pretty scattered around. The past pictures were fine, but some tended to wear pajama type outfits, mostly PJ pants and a t-shirt to Thanksgiving. No big deal to me, but past picture was mixed with mostly nicely dressed people and then a random few in pajamas. This year I texted each family and asked them to have a nice but casual outfit for the picture but feel free to dress however they want the rest of the day. I even said jeans and a nice shirt is okay for the picture. So day of Thanksgiving. My wife's cousin Sarah's family arrived that included three stepkids. Two dressed in pajamas but had a change of clothes. Sarah comes up to me and says, please don't be mad. A second later, the eldest son, Sam, came dressed in a full gothic outfit, chains, black makeup, and spiked dyed hair. Normally, they dress slightly goth, like they prefer black but nothing crazy. Never before have they even gone close to this. They said something like, hope you like the outfit, I'm wearing this for the picture. I forgot what I said, but it was barely anything. Probably a grunt or uh-huh. I say to Sarah, they can't wear that in the picture. I don't say anything else. My wife gives me the same look but then walks away. I get back to cooking for the 20 plus people. Picture time comes and we take the group photo with Sam included. Then I tell Sam I would like a few pictures without them in it. They try to get argumentative and I said along the lines of, you know that I asked people to dress nicely just for the group photo. You purposely dress like this to spite me and I have no idea why. It was awkward but Sarah told Sam to step aside and we took the photo. Day goes on fine and I know people probably talked. Today I saw some Facebook posts mentioning the situation and it's annoying me. I stand by my decision and not sure if I'll respond privately or not. So, am I the jerk for kicking Sam out of the family photo because of the way they dressed? Final update. My wife emailed all of the pictures from Thanksgiving, only sent the family photo with Sam to everyone and not the one excluding Sam. Sam was doing the air guitar in a funny face. Someone pointed out Sam was also doing a gesture at the camera with their strumming hand. 
One person in the email group requested the other family photo because Sam had done this towards the camera. My wife sent it to everyone in the email. Sam decided to call me instead of waiting for Friendsgiving this weekend. They wanted to explain what happened. They thought it was funny. I asked people to dress nice and wanted to play a prank on me and put it on TikTok. They took a part of their Halloween outfit and modified it to be a full goth outfit with crazy hair and makeup. They wanted to get a reaction out of me for a TikTok video before changing into their normal clothes for pictures. Sam hoped my wife or I would be really upset and make a scene. Neither of us did, even during the photo shoot. It was just slightly awkward, so Sam decided not to put up the video. I did find out that he used the costume to scare some of the younger kids, who are about 1-4 to four years old, and did put those on TikTok. Sam's mom made them take those down. We didn't see them because we don't have TikTok. Sam arrived and I didn't say much because I was busy, cooking and confused and annoyed. They decided to keep the outfit on until I said something. Sam did help me peeling potatoes and other stuff, but I never mentioned the outfit. They thought it was a game of chicken at that point. It got until a little before dinner and I pulled everyone together to start pictures. Sam was surprised because we had done pictures after dinner the last two years. They came up to ask how their outfit was and I just said, fine, I don't really remember this part. So they kept the joke going. Sam said they assumed there would be another group photo later. Well, we got to the group photo and Sam kept egging on the joke, hoping to get some big reaction out of me. After taking the group photo with Sam included, I just told them to step out for a few pictures. Sam's mom also told them to step aside. They decided to not egg me on in front of everyone and jumped out of the picture. Pictures happened, we ate dinner, and then Sam changed and dressed as they normally do the next two days. They later realized there wasn't going to be another group photo. They felt awkward and just didn't bring it up the rest of the weekend. They decided not to use the videos for TikTok. Sam apologized because they knew my wife was big into photo albums and put me in a weird spot. I accepted and told them I'm going to post everything on Facebook later. Sam asked me not to because it's really embarrassing. We're okay now and my wife doesn't care because we got the pictures with and without Sam. She will put both in the photo album. I removed the edit with Sam's mom because it was just repeating the story. You're the jerk. So you're saying that you didn't have a rebellious teenager phase? It's a family picture. Not one family is this perfect little image that you're trying to force. In the future, anyone looking at that photo would have probably just said, yep, that's so-so and moved on. But way to say, you're not welcome in the family, to a 14-year-old just trying to either A, be rebellious, or B, express themselves. Edit. I realize OP has edited his post multiple times and that the 14-year-old was doing it for clout. This comment was made prior to the edits. Sorry, but for all the people saying that you're the jerk, first, OP is the host of this event, cooking for 20 plus people. Their home, their rules. Requesting nice outfits usually doesn't mean eccentric behavior. I'm gonna get downvoted, but not the jerk. Even their mom said, don't be mad, so she knew they were pushing the limits. Mom of the kid can instill some manners about being guests when OP is doing that much work cooking. You sound exhausting, and I don't think I'd even want to be in your family picture. Guess what? This is reality. No family is perfect. Your perfectly staged photos don't allow people to be themselves. You're the jerk. If Sam really dressed that way to spite you, imagine how confused he would have been if you just didn't comment and allowed the pictures to be taken as usual showing them that their ploy didn't work. You messed up. On the other hand, if Sam dressed that way because they liked those clothes and felt good in them and was excited to be photographed with the family that way, you were rude and excluded a kid who just discovered their sense of style. You messed up. Either way, you're the jerk. Not the jerk. The problem with all you commenters is that you have no values. You don't have respect for yourselves or others. You have no morals. All you do is relate yourselves to the most victimized people in these stories, so you side with them every time. You do this because in your mind you are also a victim and you think the world is so unfair because you don't get everything you want handed to you. So it makes you feel good to bash people who actually have morals and values like OP. You are all the most delusional bunch of people I've ever come across and you really make me lose faith in humanity. I normally don't reply to people who say things as stupid as what you said, but let me lay out some facts for you very quickly. 1. So we have no morals and values, but you think some loser who excludes his nephew from a family photo does? Please. 2. 
Not everyone on here claims to be a victim. That's all in your head. Projection much? I mean, most of us have probably been through some crap, and you have no right whatsoever to tell us whether or not we are victims, so you can seriously buzz off with that crap. 3. We're delusional? That's laughable. You're the one passing judgment on a bunch of strangers that you know literally nothing about. If anyone here is delusional, it's you. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. My parents never would have let me pull a stunt like that growing up. My son wants me to downgrade the family hike on Christmas for his out-of-shape girlfriend. Ever since I can remember, our family has always gone on a hike the morning of Christmas. We did it all through my childhood. My husband's family did it. My friends' families are similar, though for some it's just a walk, or some go into the city and do an easy 5 or 10k run. My son, Porter, has been dating Emily for the past 6 months. I'm happy she's going to join us. They're coming from the city about 3 hours away, so they'll be staying overnight. I've met Emily before, and I think she's a great match for Porter. I know there's all that hoopla about the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law dynamic, and I just have no time for any of that. If Porter likes her, and she treats him with kindness, and he the same, who am I to complain? I Skyped with them on Thanksgiving, just making plans for who's bringing what for Christmas, gifts and such, and I mentioned that she should remember to bring her hiking boots, but we'll have plenty of yak tracks if the trails are icy. She was visibly confused and asked what for, so I explained. She got quiet and asked if she had to. I said no, of course she doesn't have to, but we've always done this, and I was surprised Porter didn't mention it. The next day, Porter called and explained that Emily is not in great shape and would struggle with keeping up, even on one of the easier trails nearby. He said that maybe we can just do a nice short family walk in the neighborhood this year so she feels more welcome. I said that maybe the two of them can hang back and enjoy a nice quiet morning before the festivities begin while the rest of us go for the hike. I remember being young with Porter's father and how special those early Christmas mornings always were. Plus, this will be her first time with the family, and it's going to be a lot. Porter got annoyed and said I'm not hearing him. He said that he really thinks we need to cut the hike down or make different plans. I told him in return that this is a family tradition that goes back for years, and changing it for one person isn't fair to the rest of the family. We are at a stalemate. I even said that if they hang back for the morning, I'd be happy to go on a nice walk with Emily and Porter later in the day during a quiet moment. He said I'm still not hearing him. Am I the jerk for not being willing to downgrade the hike to a little stroll around the neighborhood? Not the jerk. You offered a choice of doing a walk around the neighborhood later or just letting them hang back. Porter is being ridiculous for thinking that everyone should change plans for his new girlfriend. This. Porter is not hearing mom. The answer is no. She's not going to change the hike for one person. I don't understand why Porter is making this a huge issue. Just hang back, do an easy walk or whatever they want. It really shouldn't be that big of a deal. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. You heard him. You also stated that they could go on a short walk after dinner. He's not willing to compromise. Ah, love. You shouldn't have to change years of tradition for one person, and it's okay if you don't. Am I the jerk for using flashcards to explain to my brother and his wife why they can't bring their miracle baby to my wedding? My fiance, female, and I, male, are getting married. We've decided wedding's gonna be child-free just to keep it more organized and contained. My brother, Chris, and his wife have a three-year-old son who everyone calls Miracle or Rainbow Baby. He came after several failed pregnancies that lasted for years. When they found out that my nephew was included in the no kids rule, they tried to convince me to make an exception for him. Chris told me his son is a Miracle Baby and his presence at the wedding will bring blessings for me and my fiance. I refused and said no, the wedding is child free. His wife kept sending my fiance pics of my nephew when he was months old. What does that mean? I told them no and to stop. My brother told me this might cause a rift in our relationship. I again said no and explained that the wedding is child free. He asked again and pointed out how his baby is different since he's a rainbow, a miracle baby. I again said no and explained that this wedding is child free. They brought it up when they visited at my home and I knew they weren't going to stop, so I had made flashcards in advance with the phrase, the wedding is child free, period, and I pulled them out and started slowly showing them the flashcards one by one in this order. The wedding, with a sticker of the bride and groom, is child, with a sticker of a baby, free, 
with a sticker of a no sign. Period. With a huge black dot sticker. They both were stunned. I asked if they get it now, and Chris lost his mind. His wife had already grabbed her stuff and walked out. Chris called me a jerk for doing this and said that I disrespected him, his wife, and their son, who's my one and only nephew. He rushed out after we argued. My fiancé saw the whole thing and thought that it was funny, but my parents and Chris are livid beyond measure. They're telling everyone about the amount of disrespect and mockery I had displayed towards them, and I'm being told to fix it now. Well, I suppose you could have used hand puppets instead, but flashcards seem to have gotten the message across. It makes me insane how some parents think their little bundle of joy should be allowed anywhere, any when, any time, and that no never applies to them. It's pretty clear that they were going to run this horse right up to the altar. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. You are a legend. I'm glad that Chris and his wife managed to get pregnant, but their child is no more special than anyone else's, which is to say, not special at all except to the child's parents. This miracle and rainbow baby stuff well, again, I'm glad they got their kid after difficulties. A lot of folks don't get that opportunity. But the kid isn't Christ reborn, and they need to get that out of their thick skulls. The flashcards, honestly, are a solid way of showing them that. If the rest of the family gives you trouble, be sure to let the others with kids know that they think their miracle child is more special than their normal, mundane kids, Chris's words, and watch their support dry up. Exactly. There are literally millions of rainbow babies out there. Theirs is no more special than any other. I say not the jerk. They did not respect your choice. I would honestly hire security because I bet money they will try to show up with their baby and be like, she can't do anything because we are here with her. I say hire security and make sure they know anyone who brings a kid will not be admitted. And you will have security there to be sure that this rule is followed. Plus, what you did sounds absolutely hilarious. Couple decided to steal a deed parking space. I work in a place with a deeded garage parking. Had one sweet old lady, I'll call her Granny, who owned a Mini Cooper. Another couple who rented a unit did not have a parking spot and took to planting their economy car in her spot. When Granny complained, the renters would just say they were entitled because there were so many empty parking places so Granny could park somewhere else. What do they not get about deeded parking? This continued until the day the sweet old lady decided to not be so sweet, pulled her car in front of the two renters' car and parked bumper to bumper, put a note on their car saying, parking in this space is $150 a day. Please leave a check with the concierge. So the two renters showed up at my desk complaining about their car being blocked off and actually expected me to tow Granny's car off. I had to re-explain that deeded parking meant that I could not tow a car from Granny's spot any more than I could rearrange furniture in her apartment. It's her land. She owns it. You abandon your car on her property. Talk to Granny. So after 20 minutes or so of this renter's crap, I called Granny, even though it was early in the morning. She came down to the desk in her house coat and slippers with her dog in tow. They begged her to move her car. Granny told them it would be $150. Leave the check with the concierge. They kept complaining. Then she told them it would be an extra 50 for waking her up in the morning because they claimed an emergency. Then they asked her how long before she left the garage. Granny told them, Dearies, I'm retired. I'll leave my spot when I'm ready. And the price just went up to $150 a day plus 50 for waking me. And that will be in cash. Leave the envelope with the concierge. I'm walking my dog and I'll move my car when I have your rental fee in hand. Not only did the renters not park in her spot, but word got around and I didn't have to deal with that issue for another two years. Teacher threw away my niece's lunch, so I picked her up and took her to get a happy meal. I, 20 female, am babysitting my niece, who's four, for the week while my sister is on a business trip. My niece misses her mom, so to cheer her up, I put a couple treats in her lunch. Her lunch was a turkey and cheese sandwich with cucumbers and avocado, I also drew some cartoon characters on it with edible markers. Carrot sticks and ranch, apple slices, cookie, fruit snacks, brownie, and a juice box. Clearly not the healthiest, but also this is a special treat and she has all five food groups. I dropped my niece off at 9 and at 10, snack time, I got a call from the teacher saying I had to drop off a new lunch because my niece's was too unhealthy. I told her to give my niece the fruits or vegetables if she has a problem with the treats 
and she told me she threw away the lunch because it was distracting to the other kids. I decided to call the office and tell them that I needed to pull my niece out for an appointment at 11, lunch is at 11.30, and that she'd be back by the end of lunch. So at 11, I picked her up. We got happy meals, cookies, fruit snacks, and milkshakes. Then at 12, end of lunch, I dropped her off with her happy meal box and her almost finished milkshake. Teacher saw this and was fuming. I guess she told my sister what happened because shortly after, I got a call from my sister saying I was being petty and should have just dropped off a new sandwich. Am I the jerk for pulling my niece out and filling her up on sugar because her teacher threw away her lunch? Not the jerk. That teacher is the jerk for throwing away perfectly good food, no matter what. Not the jerk. So a cookie and a brownie means that you tossed the whole lunch? The teacher was out of line. Not the jerk. What kind of power trip do you have to be on to throw away a four-year-old's lunch? Am I the jerk for selling a house that was left to me? I, male 24, grew up next to a sweet old lady. Her husband passed and she lived alone. When I was 11, she offered me 50 bucks a week to walk her dog since she was unable to. This ended up turning into me helping her around for some cash. I would mow her lawn, fix up things around the house, and buy her groceries. She paid me good money and she was a kind person. Eventually, I realized how lonely she was, so I would often go over to her house and spend time with her since her actual family lived far away. Towards the end of high school, she started losing it and she'd forget things. I felt bad accepting money and started making up excuses and would lie to get out of her paying me. I think she realized I was avoiding her payments and felt bad. At the end of my senior year, she wrote me a check for my college tuition. Keep in mind, my tuition was close to $25,000 a year and she paid for a full year. I tried to not accept the gift, but she insisted that I accept. After I went to college, she hired a caregiver and didn't really need me, but I still tried to visit. Well, this year she passed, and I was on her will. She gave me her home and some money. Her immediate family fought hard to get the home from me, but I fought hard to keep it. I offered for them to visit and grab any family keepsakes, but after that, the home was mine. I decided I'm selling the home and moving across the country for a new job opportunity. Her family came at me hard and demanded I sell it to them. I told them I'll hear their offers and if it's close to my asking price, I'd give them priority. Their offer was 70% of asking price after I did $35,000 in renovations. I rejected them and sold the house to another buyer. I now have to deal with like 20 angry emails a week claiming I'm selling away the house they grew up in to a random. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You offered them priority to buy it and they lowballed you. It was left to you and you can do whatever you want with it. Not the jerk. It was her home and money and I'm sure she had her reasons for not leaving it to her family. Perhaps they should reflect on why they weren't willed her house. Not the jerk. Legally, it was your house. They wanted it for sentimental value, which is understandable. But in the end, you were lowballed on their offer. You sold the house to someone who offered a better price. Edit. If they continue to contact you about the house and whatnot, take legal action. They are harassing you. Nephew threw a huge tantrum because I didn't give him my son's toy. We hosted Thanksgiving at my place. My brother, his wife, and their almost four-year-old son were among the guests. As people were leaving, my brother asked if my nephew could take home one of my two-year-old son's toy trucks. My nephew had been playing with it nonstop since they arrived and wanted to keep it. My brother said that he'd replace the toy if I told him where I got it. I told my brother that I'd be happy to give him a link to the store where I bought it, but I would not give the toy to him then and there. I refused for two reasons. Firstly, my brother slash sister-in-law have a terrible habit of giving my nephew everything he asks for. He is way too old for that. Secondly, I don't want to reinforce in my nephew that it's okay to just take things he wants. My brother said that my nephew would throw a tantrum if he didn't get the toy then and there and that everything would be easier if I just let him take the toy and get sent a replacement in the mail. I told my brother that I would not be an enabler for my nephew's bad behavior and that it's my brother and sister-in-law's problem if he throws a tantrum. Of course, the inevitable happened. My nephew started shrieking inconsolably at the top of his lungs and my brother, sister-in-law, and nephew had to leave. Later that evening, I got an angry text from my brother saying that my nephew screamed his head off for the entire three-hour card ride home and only stopped screaming after he literally passed out from exhaustion. He said that the tantrum was my fault 
since it would have been completely avoided if I had just given my nephew the toy and accused me of backseat parenting, since in his words, it's not my place to set an example for his son. My wife thinks we should have just handed the toy over to make things easier, especially since our son has a ton of toys and is not particularly attached to that specific truck and would not have noticed it missing for just a couple days. I still maintain that it's well within my rights to set an example for my nephew even if it goes against my brother and sister-in-law's parenting style of coddling their son, and that the tantrum is 100% a result of their terrible parenting habits. Not the jerk. Your brother may think that it's easier to give in to his son's tantrums, but he's starting to reap what he's sown now. The three-hour tantrum is his own fault for never teaching the kid proper boundaries and for teaching him that his parents would give him anything if he'd just throw a tantrum. Everyone sucks here. Your brother and his wife were absolutely in the wrong for making their kid's behavior your fault. Nephew's behavior is not your fault, no matter your decision about the toy. Where I do think you are a little bit the jerk is that you took this as a chance to berate your brother's parenting. You clearly have opinions about his parenting skills, which means you've seen this happen over the years, and thus have had plenty of time to talk to him about it in a less charged environment. The end of a holiday meal where they are staring down the face of a three-hour drive with a tantrum-prone child isn't really the time to give advice and have it be listened to and taken to heart. I think you were right to not hand over your kid's toy, and your wife is probably sick of hearing you complain about your brother, so I can see where she's coming from. Am I the jerk for refusing to make a $120 cut of steak well done? So, we did a bit of an extravagant Friendsgiving this year, as I lucked into a strip loin of A5 Wagyu for a price that was unorthodox levels of cheap. My friend works for a high-end meat distributor and received it as a gift. It was a tight-knit event with only 10 of us there, mostly couples, including my friend who only started dating a girl within the last couple months. We had an array of dishes, but I was responsible for cooking the meat. Steak is about the closest thing I have to a religion, and I take it very seriously. The average steak for me takes about four to five hours to prepare and cook, from the sous vide to the cast iron to plate, though sometimes I take as much as three to four months butter aging or dry aging my meats to be certain that they are perfect. These were genuine A5, so I only sous vide them after cutting them into two inch steaks. There was pretty perfectly enough for one each, but I also made jerk chicken, mandarin duck breast, and a nice cut of cherry jalapeno salmon. I had quite the spread. I sous vide them to medium rare to be sure the fat was well rendered, but informed them that if absolutely necessary, I'd bring them up to medium on request. Can we get some Karens or Kyles to tell Redder Boy how to correctly pronounce these words? Please do, it helps out in the algorithm. Well, here comes the new girl to the group. She sees the first person cut into their steak and sees pink and she is just mortified. Immediately, she starts talking about eating raw meat and stresses that the steak should be brown all the way through or else you'll get sick. I informed her that this wasn't the case and that these steaks were actually cooked to the ideal temperature for the cut. She immediately demanded that I cook hers till it was brown all the way through and I firmly said, not a chance. She proceeded to get angry and yelled that it was her steak and she should have it how she liked. I told her that there were plenty of other meats to choose from as well as a plethora of side dishes that she could have, but her steak was not being made well done in my house. She said, jerk. Then she got up and started to stick the steak in the microwave. I got up and grabbed it out of her hand first, at which point half the steak fell onto the ground. My dogs quickly got to it, to which I said, well, at least it went to someone who wouldn't complain on a good steak. From there, there was definitely tension from that end of the table. They ate a little bit, then hurriedly left. Since then, my longtime friend and his new girlfriend have blocked me on social media and my phone number. They've even gone so far as to block the rest of the people at the table and cut off all ties. Yesterday, I received a PayPal invoice from my old friend for $25 that just said, pay for dry cleaning of her dress. I don't think anything actually spilled on her. I think it's just more drama, but as of now, I'm ignoring it and unfortunately, probably washing my hands clean of an old friend. Am I the jerk here? Edit. I should state that a menu was sent weeks in advance with the express point that if someone wanted their steak cooked to a higher temperature, I'd really go to the grocery store and get some USDA Prime for them. Everyone sucks here. She was a terrible guest and you were an obnoxious host. 
Don't get me wrong, I can't even eat meat above a medium rare temp, but when you choose to cook for someone, you don't get to dictate how they eat it. You're gifting them a dish and they can do how they will with it, in the manner they enjoy it. The fact you'd rather have a dog eat the meat than the guest is pretty telling of how inconsiderate and controlling of a host you are. You're the jerk, assuming this is even real, because I can't fathom someone being this much of a jerk to their friends. You weren't the one eating the steak, she was. She can have it however she wants. The fact that you not only refused to cook it to her request, but then grabbed it away from her when she attempted to cook it further herself, makes you a complete and total jerk in this situation. And the fact that you'll give a $120 steak to a dog before you let a person eat it well done is just ridiculous. Won't let me meet your boyfriend? Consider your date cancelled. I'm a single dad and I have been for about 9 years now. My daughter is 13 and she's the single greatest thing to ever happen to me. About a week ago, she said that this boy in her class wanted to know if she would be up to grab a pizza on that Saturday. We don't really do anything for Thanksgiving, so logistically it worked out well. She agreed to it. When she told me about this, I said that I wanted to meet this guy. She immediately got annoyed and asked why. I said that if a guy is asking my daughter out, I just want to be able to put a face to a name. I promised her it was not going to be some goofy, dad interrogates boyfriend and acts all scary tactic. I told her to tell him I wanted to meet him and to just say, hi. She tells me that she told him. Saturday comes and I see her heading towards the door. I tell her to hold up and I ask where her date is. She says that he's outside and that they're going to bike ride to the pizza place. I ask why he's not coming to the door. She first tells me he's nervous and doesn't know what he'd say to me. I told her that nice to meet you is a good start. Her story changes and she tells me that he just doesn't see why I have to meet him. I reiterated my why to her and asked her to go get him. She breaks down and tells me that she lied to me. She never told him I wanted to meet him because she thought it was stupid that I wanted to meet him. I told her to text him that the date was off. She said I wasn't allowed to do that. I asked her again to tell him. She started getting teary-eyed, texted him, told me I was mean and that she hated me and went to her room. When I told my sister what happened, she thought I was in the wrong and said I should have just let my daughter go on the date. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. I know your intentions were good, but no daughter wants a dad to be up in their business when dating. I understand, truly, you are trying to be a protective parent, but the way you went about it was terrible. Turning pizza into a guy dating my daughter was mistake number one. You turned a very casual hangout into something more serious than even they were ready to attach to it. Then telling your daughter to tell the guy you wanted to meet him was mistake number two. That doesn't mean you couldn't have met him any more than you could meet any other of her friends before they hang out. But making it this formal, put too much pressure on the situation. Finally, when your daughter broke down and was honest with you, you punished her by canceling the date. Why would she ever be honest with you again? Need I remind you, all of this could have been avoided if you had simply walked outside with her, said hi to the date, and then left them alone. I know you were trying to be a good parent, but trust me, next time your daughter gets a date, she won't even tell you, because she's learned that it's better not to. Edit to add, OP, for the future, maybe consider how you would have approached this if it was just your daughter hanging out with a new friend. That should show you that there are ways to have safety measures and meet who she's hanging out with without doing the whole, what are your intentions with my daughter thing. I completely understand where you're coming from. I just want to share a different perspective. I was 13 and a freshman in high school. If I ever wanted to hang out with friends, even if my mom had met them before, she would need their number and to meet their parents and get their numbers as well. I was honestly shocked that I was ever even invited to just hang out with people. I have anxiety and I get nervous a lot. So when my mom told me I would have to get all of the information, I just never asked to hang out. I never went out or did anything. I was always too nervous to ask or what rules my mom would put in place. I also had great grades and never got in trouble. I still have a hard time making friends and yes, it's due to me and how nervous I get meeting new people. I would have liked to have actually done things and had fun while in school. Your daughter and her safety comes first, which I completely understand, but you could have opened the door yourself and met the boy. Kids get nervous over things like this. I would have been terrified and thought that you would have said no, no matter the circumstances, even if it was a good kid outside the door. You're the jerk. My dad did the same thing when I was growing up, and guess what happened? I stopped telling him anything and everything. Like it or not, you're a controlling parent, and don't be surprised when your daughter goes no contact with you. 
You'll feel bad when she ends up like me because of the controlling parents I had. I'm now almost 30, but homeless throughout most of my 20s and have had four babies, all of which I had to give up because I didn't have adequate housing according to the state. The struggles that I've gone through are not my fault, but all go back to my failed parents and how they always had to stick their nose in my business. To be honest, I hope your daughter ends up worse than I have just so you can see what happens when you're a bad parent. Dang. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for wanting to meet him or not? Please let us know. I can't think of many places that are worse to seek parenting advice from than Reddit. If you don't agree with me, leave right now. In June of 2021, I joined a tech startup, Last Mile Grocery and Food Delivery App, as financial controller. I was told my task was to bring the gross profits into black within a year and before next round of investment and fundraising. The senior team comprised of me, group CFO, COO, and head of grocery. The CEO was stationed outside in another country. The CEO comes to the country within a month of my joining, but does not bother to meet me. I say, okay, no problem. Keep your head down and do what you're tasked with. Within two months, I have the grips on operations and financials, and I've laid down my plan with group CFO and he agrees to it. I make some changes in my team and I get to working on fixing things. During October, one of our competitors raises 85 million in investments and our CEO is irked. He comes again and starts an impromptu investment round. The conditions are better than before, so we get an offer of 50 million because our overall plan was a lot smaller and more realistic than our competitor. The CEO rejects the offer. He needs an offer of at least 100 million to beat the competitor. Luckily, we get offered 200 million, but the CEO refuses, citing this is greater than what I need and goes back without accepting anything. Come February, Group CFO suddenly quits, but I knew he quit since our funds were depleting rapidly and the economic conditions in the country and globally were getting worse. I have an emergency meeting with COO and grocery head and tell them that we need to rationalize our expenses further and this is the plan, according to which we will be profitable by June 2022. They agree to it and I get to work with my team. The CEO again does not talk to me and the CFO post remains vacant despite me being next in line and eligible for it. Come March 2022, my plan is on track and we are expecting profitability a month earlier in May of 2022. I plan to take a week-long vacation and travel abroad with my spouse. In the third day of vacation, I get a text from COO that I need to come back as something has happened. I tell him I'll come back as planned and not to worry. I come back and find out that the supply chain team made an error and bought inventory $30 million more than planned for the festive season coming up in May. In my absence, the grocery head gave the go-ahead without consulting me and the error was only identified once the vendor started fulfilling the order. This has shook our overall plan and our cash funds are at bottom. Mr. CEO comes to know about this. I was the one to inform him and he immediately comes down and started literally going off on me and the other members of the team verbally. This is the first ever face-to-face -face meeting with me. I was quite taken aback by his rudeness and hurt as he put all the blame on me saying I am the CFO, when I was never appointed as such, so no payments or purchases were approved by me. They were being approved by COO and head of grocery. This verbal mistreatment goes on for about a week, during which I had broken down twice in front of my wife, as I had never faced such BS before in my career, and I had worked really hard to bring the company to where it was at that point. The CEO warns us that whoever is found guilty of negligence will be fired on the spot. This is where the malicious compliance begins. I prepare detailed documents pointing out my plan and who approved the extra purchase and how I was consulted only after the error had occurred. I even prepared a plan to sell off the excess inventory and bring the money back into the fold. I try to reach him to explain, but he brushes me off every time, saying, you cannot be right. After seven days, the CEO calls us in the office on a weekend. I arrive and head of grocery is there. They are arguing and it's getting heated up. It gets so heated that the head of grocery shouts back and leaves, citing that he quits. As soon as he leaves, the CEO pounded his fist on the table and shouted, If you don't agree with me, leave right now. Only I know how to run this company, and if you think I cannot work without you, think again. The moment I heard these words spewing out of his mouth, I switched to autopilot. I type in my resignation email to him right then and there, get up and say to him, please check your email. My notice starts now. 
I leave the building before he could respond. Immediately, I call up one of my ex-bosses slash mentor and tell him that I need to meet him. We meet, and within a week, we plan to start our own consultancy firm, and six months from then, our firm has started to grow. We're working on our startup, setting up another business, and managing top-tier clients. Then, I get a message from that CEO through the COO after a few months of my leaving. Hey, we need your help managing the books and finances. Our position is really bad. I simply say, the CEO won't agree with what I have to do to fix the company, and I don't work with clients who don't agree with me. Am I the jerk for telling my sister nobody was interested in her PhD research? My sister, who's 34, and I, 31 female, come from a working class family. Nobody in our family has higher than a high school education, save for us. I have a bachelor's, and my sister is currently working on her PhD. Obviously, we're both proud of this, but my sister often brags to an extent that many in our family find uncomfortable or discouraging, and she talks down to the people around her. When she began her program, she explained it in very technical terms that confused our aunt. When she was asked to clarify, my sister made a fuss about how it was so easy for her to understand, and she forgets that not everyone can wrap their heads around it. It's been an issue since she started her master's, and I've admittedly been at my wit's end with her for quite a while. I hosted Thanksgiving this year. When we were eating, my sister was asked about her research, and she went on a long, complicated spiel about her work. She was missing context, pulling out every 10 cent word, getting super technical, and under explaining every concept. She talked for about 10 minutes straight, barely pausing for questions or comments. It dominated conversation. Eventually, I interrupted her and tried asking our dad about his work. My sister interrupted him and said she wasn't finished, then continued talking. I told her I was finished listening to her and that she could talk all she wanted, but she'd need to do it in another room. She made some comments about my hosting and continued on. I stopped her again and told her that nobody was interested and she needed to be quiet, which she did. It was admittedly extremely awkward and quiet and my husband decided to just plow on and make conversation with an aunt of mine. After that, conversation carried on as usual with my sister being very, very quiet. Afterwards, our parents scolded me for being rude but said my sister was being over the top but I should have just let her talk. A few of our other relatives thanked me for cutting her off. Her fiancé called me yesterday morning and said I embarrassed my sister and I made her feel ashamed. He implied I was jealous of her success and asked me to formally apologize to her. I said I'd apologize to her, but I wouldn't mean it, and he hung up on me. I've thought it over and I can see how my approach was wrong, but I genuinely did not see any other option at the time. Always willing to learn though and seeking a new perspective. Am I the jerk for telling my sister nobody was interested in her PhD research? Everyone sucks here. Your sister needs to know how to explain her doctoral work to a lay audience if she has any hope of passing her dissertation committee. She also needs to learn how to craft an elevator sentence. She also needs to learn how to take a hint gracefully. You need to stop being jealous of her success. Conscious of it or not, jealousy and resentment oozes out of this entire post. Regardless of how long she droned on and how rude it was of her to stop you from talking with your dad, the general core of this post isn't really centered on that but your overall worldview on her academic career. I don't think OP sounds jealous. I think she just doesn't want to hear about all that crap. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her sister? Please let us know. Sometimes it takes drastic measures to get certain people to just shut up. A very expensive check. This malicious compliance is not my own. It was related to me by my mother many decades ago, but it's also not hers. She just got to play her part in this story. But since she passed decades before Reddit existed for her to share it with you wonderful people, I'll pass it on for her. This is a case of an intended malicious compliance being countered by an even more malicious compliance. My mother is, at this time, a manager in the central processing office of a now defunct major regional bank, easily the largest bank in our region back in the day. She receives a rather odd check for processing and refuses to run it until she has the full story on what's happening. So here's what she learns. A rancher has been in a land dispute with one of his neighbors, and it has not gone amicably. We are not privy to the exact nature of the issue, and it seems to have something to do with water rights. Either way, it ends up in court, and after a long, hard-fought battle of legal wills, the rancher loses and is ordered to pay a certain amount of damages to his neighbor by a certain date. 
Well, that's not a happy thing for the rancher. So he decides that while he must pay, there's absolutely nothing in the court order that says he has to make it easy on his adversary. Malicious compliance engaged. He shaves a spot on the rump of one of his cows and carefully writes out a check for the full amount of the court ordered damages on the skin of the bovine. He then has one of his trucks deliver the cow to his neighbor to settle the account. A live cow. After checking with the bank, the neighbor concludes that it's perfectly legal for the rancher to write a check on anything, and the rancher makes it perfectly clear that this is the only way he intends to settle the debt. But just like folks who decide to settle an annoying bill with thousands of coins sometimes find themselves victims of their own malicious intent, the neighbor's malicious compliance trumps the rancher's. The neighbor loads the cow onto one of his trucks and takes it to the rancher's bank, the bank of issuance, and cashes it against a cashier's check made out to him for the same amount. This he then deposits at his own bank with no difficulty or challenge. Meanwhile, the rancher's bank has to order a truck and a driver to deliver the cow check to its central processing office, several hours drive away. This is where my mother comes into the story. She has to cancel the check and process it. She uses a paper substitute to run through the computer system for it, just like they do for any checks that come in that are too badly wrinkled or damaged to run safely through the system. After the cow check has been properly processed and the money deducted from the rancher's account, she then opts to not store the check with his other canceled checks to return with his monthly statement, but instead orders it returned immediately to the rancher. And then, after the dust settles, the real fallout of the neighbor's malicious compliance is felt. Since the cow check involves a great deal of special handling at the bank's expense, the bank assesses appropriate fees that more than cover the expenses in processing it. If the neighbor cashes it at his own bank, he gets to pay those fees. But since he cashes it at the rancher's bank, the rancher now gets to pay what amounts to an additional 25% fee on top of the court-ordered settlement. The only cost to the rancher was 10 miles of gas for the round trip to the bank, a trip he routinely makes anyway and the time spent getting the bank to verify that the cow check is a legitimate instrument that can be cashed. When telling this story, my mother tells me it's the most expensive check she ever processed. Am I the jerk for refusing to rearrange my work schedule to take my nephew to school? So I, 28 female, don't have kids, or want them frankly. I have a job that I like, work a shift that I like. I'm early mornings, 5 or 6 in the morning to 1 or 2 p.m. It took me a while to adjust to it, but now that I am, I have a whole routine. I have a sister, M, who's 31, and she has a seven-year-old son, Timmy. I've never been that aunt that borrows my nephew for the day to go do whatever. I mean, if he's around, I'll talk to him and play with him, and I buy him gifts for special occasions. I have friends that'll take their nieces or nephews a few times a month and go to movies, different events, take them shopping and spoil them. That's never been me. Well, M called me Sunday, and asked if I could take Timmy to school in the mornings for a while. I said, what? No, I work early in the morning. She said, but didn't you say you could go to second shift if you wanted to? I can, but I don't want to. Apparently, Timmy's dad, Ryan, has to work third shift for a while, and M doesn't want him driving Timmy to school after working because he'll be tired. Our parents can't because they work. M used to work second shift and would take him to school, then M would pick him up. M works 6 to 2, but has a 30 to 45 minute commute. She wants me to go to second shift, and she'll drop him off by me, or I can come by them in the mornings, give him breakfast, get him ready, and take him to school. I asked for how long. She said she didn't know, but Ryan was going to try to move back to second shift when they have an opening. So, could be a month, could be a year. I'm not going to switch to second, and have Ryan go back to second in a month, and then I'm stuck on a shift that I hate. I can't just bounce back and forth either. I get an hour lunch break, it's usually 9 or 10, but I'm sure if I explain the situation, my boss would allow me to take it at 7.30. Then I could take Timmy to school and come back. I offered this to Entitled Mom, but she rejected it, said that she's not leaving her 7 year old home alone for 2 hours. I said, but Ryan will be there. She claimed since he might be asleep, Timmy would be on his own and that she doesn't want that. I said, well, that's all I can offer you. I'm not changing shifts. This is part of why I don't have kids, to avoid stuff like this, which he's seven, not two, but whatever. Entitled mom went running to our mom, and my mom says I should be more willing to help my sister, and it'll give me the opportunity to spend time with Timmy. Family sacrifices for each other, and entitled mom might have to find a different job because I'm being stubborn.
Am I the jerk for refusing to switch shifts? Wow, your sister sounds incredibly entitled. OP, don't cave to her demands. Stand your ground. 100% not the jerk. Old man parks his car in the middle of the road. Somehow, I'm at fault. Something bizarre happened to me yesterday. I was pulling into a parking lot when the car in front of me suddenly came to a complete stop in the middle of the lane. Its owner, an older guy, turned it off, got out, and started walking into the nearest store in the strip mall. He just parked his car in the middle of the lane. I could have gotten around it if I really tried, but it would be dangerously close to either his car or other parked cars. I lightly tapped on my horn twice at him, seeing as how I was essentially stuck now. He turned around and I rolled my window down and said to him, that's not a parking space. He dramatically pointed at my car and then did this right this way motion with both hands, aiming at the very narrow path that I guess he thought I should be able to get through. I repeated myself again, sir, that's not a parking space. I can't get around you. Him, why is it that one of you people every time just go around? So he's done this before? Me. Sir, what are you doing? That's not a parking space. I need you to move. Him. I need you to mind your own business. Me. Come on, you can't park there. Please just move your car. At this point, his lips were doing that weird shake that old people do when they hang their mouths open. I guess he thought he was being intimidating. He stepped up to my window and yelled. You want to make me? Okay, so he's done this before and he's being an aggressive jerk. Now I've read on here where other people have interacted with older Karens and there's apparently a card that you can play that bypasses this sort of attitude. Me. Sir, are you okay? Do you know where you are? Him. What? Me. Are you with someone? Is there someone who's supposed to be helping you today? What are you? Do you need help? It sounds like you don't know where you are and I'm worried for you. Is there anyone I can call for you to help you? I think he caught on to me at this point because he switched back from confused to being angry again. Him. I don't know. Is there anyone I can call for you? Is that somehow a threat? I don't know. Me. Sir, it's okay. Don't worry. You just stay right there and I'll call someone who can come help you. Don't worry. It'll be okay. Just don't move and I'll call for an ambulance. At this point, I backed into a parking space that had opened behind me and pulled out my phone. I really was going to call 911 but only because he was too confrontational to be left unattended in public. Of course, as with most bullies, the moment they realize they don't have power over you, he gave up, muttered something, got back in his car and left. On my way out of the lot, I saw that he had miraculously found his way into a parking spot on the other side of the lot. Am I the jerk for refusing to order plain cheese pizza for my girlfriend? So, in short, my girlfriend gets off of work a few hours before I do, and she typically cooks for me, which I genuinely appreciate. Today, she was feeling lazy and didn't really have any ideas for dinner. No big deal. So I told her I had been craving pizza and wouldn't mind ordering that for dinner, and she agreed. I told her that I would order it before I left for work, so by the time I got home, it would be there. She texted me back and said that's fine, but to please order cheese pizza. I asked her why, and she said she didn't really enjoy the toppings I usually get, which are super normal things like pepperoni or bacon. Mind you, this is the first time I'm hearing this. She's eaten pizza with these toppings before. So I'm like, okay, are there any toppings you'd like to eat on your pizza as opposed to just having it plain? Because at that point, it's just not even worth getting pizza if you're not going to have any toppings on it. She said no, that she just wanted plain pizza. I told her, well, if I'm buying it, I'm going to get what I want on it and suggested that she could just pick off the toppings if it bothered her that much or that we could do a sort of half and half deal where half was cheese. Then she said that she could still usually tell or taste residual flavors or oil from the toppings when she did that and didn't even want to do that and said we could just order an entire other pie for her. Neither of us are going to eat an entire pie, so that just seems frivolous to me. So I said, let's just forget the pizza idea and scrap it as a whole. Then she started telling me that I was being a jerk and really inconsiderate and I told her I sort of thought that she was being selfish a little bit, and now she's very upset with me and isn't speaking to me. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. Like, there's different sizes of pizza you could have gotten, like two smalls or a medium and a small. It also seemed like you guys always order toppings, and she kind of just dealt with it, or just didn't say anything to start something. 
You could have just compromised and gotten this one as just cheese and then next time get one with toppings, kind of like in every other situation. You're the jerk. Just buy her a cheese pizza and yourself something else. Pizza is easy to reheat, so it's not like the leftovers are going to waste. Why are you making such a big fuss over this? You're the jerk, dude. It's a pizza. It's not like you're handcrafting a gourmet buffet. Just order two small ones instead of one big one. It's the least you can do, considering she's the one that's always cooking for you. I can't believe this was even an issue for you. Not the jerk. Imagine if the boyfriend was the one complaining instead of her. Let's imagine for a moment if a girl on Reddit posts this same story from her perspective about how her boyfriend is demanding she buy them just one cheese pizza because he doesn't like toppings. He then refuses to just pick off the toppings he doesn't like and gets an attitude with her about it. All you morons would be calling him a man-child and telling her to leave him. Another day, another fine example of the hypocrisy of you deluded failures. Ouch. Entitled mom demands to swap shifts with me because she has kids. Background. All persons here are nurses. We have a system in our hospital. Big shift changes, multiple days, must be done in the month before the new month. Single days just need some days in advance. Also, we have a system for the holidays. One year you work Christmas, the next year you work New Year's Eve and New Year's. As a young guy without kids, I mostly try to cover other people's Christmas for getting New Year's off. I mean, we celebrate with close family on Christmas Eve anyways. This year I had to work Christmas and asked around if anyone wanted to swap. One of my coworkers directly answered. She told me she would gladly work New Year's for me and I work Christmas for her. We talked to our charge nurse and gave green light and changed the schedule. She was happy to see her family after last year's Christmas was in lockdown and I was happy to get hammered on New Year's Eve with my girlfriend and friends. But then today happened. Our entitled mom, or Nurse Karen, is one of my coworkers. She's okay at her job, although she complains when she can't leave on the dot. I never had any real problems with her. We just coexist. This happened on my break today. Nurse Karen Hey, OPE. Me. Oh, hi. I wasn't really paying attention. I ate my soup and browsed Reddit on my phone. Karen. Can I ask you something? Uh, sure. So, I saw you and the other nurse swapped holidays. Me. Yeah? Well, I thought you could cancel it and cover my shift on Christmas. Me. Um, no. What? Why? It's the same for you. You have your New Year's Eve off anyways. Me. Well, yeah, maybe. But the other nurse made plans with her family. Ugh, maybe. But I need Christmas off. I have kids, and she doesn't. Me. Yeah, maybe. But she has plans too. That's not fair. I had no chance to ask you first. Me. Yes, you had. I asked in our, insert instant messenger name, work group. I then showed her the message in the group. And sorry, who comes fast paints first? A saying in my language. Not so good in English, though. Ugh, that's so unfair. You both don't have kids, so Christmas isn't that important to you. It's a family holiday. Me. Yeah. The other nurse meets her family on Christmas. That's why I swapped with her. I give her my own copyrighted, forget you, sweetie, smile that I got from working in that soul-sucking snake pit, aka my hospital. Ugh. She then stomped off. I just get back to Reddit and continue to eat my onion soup. A mistake, because onion breath and masks aren't a good match. The nurse I swapped holidays with told me that Nurse Karen tried to talk her out of it too, but she wouldn't budge either. She then tried to talk to our charge nurse, but that was in vain. Our momentary charge is a work friend of me, and we are both male nurses, so we both have a secret but sacred bond to have each other's backs. Karen is upset because no one wants to swap, but that's not my problem. Thanksgiving ruined and meal stolen by entitled parent. For context, you have my sister, who's 30, my dad, 62, my mom, 65, and myself, 34. The neighbor, who's 37, and her kids, ranging in ages from 17, the oldest son, to 9, the only daughter. Thanksgiving this year, my mom, a highly disabled and perfect mom in every sense of the word, spent 14 hours getting all the food prepared for everyone. She does this as a Christmas gift to us all. We buy everything, and she cooks most of the smaller things. We buy a pre-cooked ham to make things easier on her. Around 2 p.m., 
the neighbor and her seven kids show up, asking if they could join since her husband left her and they have nowhere to go. He found out all but one kid weren't his and has fled the area. My mom tells them there isn't enough food to go around for more than the five of us. She keeps badgering my mom, all of this taking place while my dad, sister, wife, and I are grabbing last minute things and a huge thank you gift from my mom. Eventually, the kids push in and start making their own plates. My mom is in tears and finally just moved away from the door and calls me immediately. We rush home to find that nearly all the food is gone via to-go boxes they brought with them while they have gone home to eat our meal. My mom goes to lie down for a few and we call the police. An hour goes by and we wake my mom up when the police finally show up. We explain the situation to them, show them the ring doorbell footage of them coming and going and what was said, and the police say it's her word against the entire clan of trash since my mom moved aside to let them through. They leave without even letting us file a report, even having the nerve to tell us we shouldn't do anything since the woman is having a hard time and we should just be thankful we have each other for the holiday. On Saturday, all of us, mom included, are at the police station with pictures of the before and after of the meal, video with audio from the ring doorbell, and wish to file charges against them for theft and elderly mistreatment and assault. The mom and her kids knocked my mom over on their way out. We also show the officer video of the interaction of the police response captured by my sister's phone. I'm just heartbroken as we spent all of our Thanksgiving in tears consoling my mom and making the best of what was left. Reply this is terrible. I hope you pick a different day and have a Thanksgiving dinner all over again so you can properly celebrate and give thanks for each other. In the meantime, I'd put this story and the ring footage on next door so all your neighbors can see who these pieces of crap are. OP. We had a small meal with what was left, which wasn't much. We are planning on having a Christmas dinner at my home the week before Christmas Day possibly if everything goes as planned. People in the neighborhood we know well were given a copy of our written statement to the police department and a link to see both videos, the ring footage, and what my sister took when the authorities decided to show up. Three of them provided the police with footage from their homes as well as letting us have a copy. You can clearly see what happened from the entire perspective of the footage we've pieced together. Due to legal advice, we can't show the footage online since it would show the identities of the minors involved. From my neighbor across the street's camera, you can see the entitled parent and her kids discussing something right before they walk up to the door. See all of the kids push past my mom as soon as the door opens, my mother disappear from the doorway in a single frame, and the entitled parent and kids exit the threshold of the doorway with arms full and briskly walk out of frame. Karen stole my cat, so I stole her back. I got pebbles from a humane society when she was two months old. I love her with my whole heart. She's now five years old, soon to be six. Fourteen months ago, I had to move to an apartment that didn't allow pets in the contract. I had no choice but to rehome Pebbles and I was heartbroken. But my grandma ended up taking her from me so it wasn't so bad because I could visit Pebbles anytime. She was safe in a house, all indoors and well taken care of. Three months ago, grandma passed. And of course, that was hard enough. But on top of that, Pebbles got grabbed without anyone's consulting me and brought to my uncle and aunt's house to live. They put her outside with their other farm cats. I drove out on my day off to see her, and she was looking scared and bedraggled. But they insisted that she was fine. I went home heartbroken and I was angry. Recently, I was able to move into a better apartment that's pet-friendly with a roommate. I asked if I could have Pebbles back, but my aunt said no, that my cousins, who are 15 and 18, have grown attached. But frankly, oh well. So I said, fine, okay. Then last week during work hours, I took off on my lunch break, drove to the farm while they were at work and school, found Pebbles, put her in my car, and drove home to my new apartment. It took them two days to even figure out that she was gone. Then, of course, my aunt called me and asked if I had taken Pebbles. I said yes. She started to yell, so I just said, she's my cat, and I gave her to grandma for a while, not you, and then I hung up. I think I'm legally in the clear here because I took Pebbles back to the vet I took her to her whole life for a checkup, got her papers up to date, got her microchipped and put her in my name. But my parents called me and told me that they were disappointed in me, that it was immature to steal Pebbles and that the girls are apparently heartbroken. I'm sorry my cousins are sad, but I would do it again. Pebbles is my cat and they weren't taking care of her correctly. 
I never wanted to give her up anyway. If I'm the jerk, that's fine. Not the jerk. Sounds more like you rescued your cat to me. Yes, putting a cat that's grown up indoors outdoors with other cats who are used to being outdoors is cruel. Cats are territorial and were probably quite hard on your cat. Not to mention that outdoor cats have a significantly shorter life expectancy than an indoor cat. OP did the right thing. She rescued Pebbles, and getting her chipped and vetted right away was exactly the right move. OP, I'm so glad you have your kitty back. Not the jerk. Am I the jerk for taking money from my wife's account to pay for my computer that she broke? My wife is a stay-at-home mom. She works hard taking care of our kids and maintaining our home. I do what we have agreed is a fair portion of the housework and all of the yard work. She has full access to all of our accounts except for my personal spending account. I put the exact same amount into her personal spending account, but I can only deposit, not withdraw. I have a home office, but I don't work from home. It's just a place I can go to sit and catch up on anything I might need to work from home on and also play video games or play with my toys. My wife also has a room that's dedicated to her and her hobbies. I've asked her multiple times to please leave my room alone. I clean it myself, I take my dishes to the kitchen, and either wash them or place them in the dishwasher. I take out my own trash. When I play with my kids in my office, I clean up after all of us. When my wife joins me in my office for video games, I clean up afterwards. There's quite literally no reason for her to do anything in there when I am not in it. I do not have a lock on my door, but I do have my laptop password protected. I like to line up some of my collection of Lego minifigures by my screen on my laptop. I like to imagine that Batman and Spider-Man are watching me work. I know it's silly, but I like it. For some reason, my wife decided to go clean my office. I guess she needed to move my laptop, so she closed it. Not all the way, because my minifigures were in the way. When I came home, she told me what had happened. The screen was not working at all. I had to get my old monitor out and hook it up so I could check and see if anything else was busted. It was just the screen. I checked, and it would cost about $250 for parts and labor to replace my screen. So I decided to replace the laptop and use the old one with my old monitor for the kids. It was fine other than the non-working screen. The cost to replace my laptop was only $600. Yay, Black Friday. So I took $350 from my account, and I took $250 from the money I was going to deposit into her personal account for December, and I got my new computer. This will in no way affect our budget for anything other than our own personal side projects and hobbies. I was looking forward to getting myself a new Lego set to work on with my kids over the holidays, but now I will have to rebuild one of my old ones with them, which is also fun. Well, now she's upset at me because she has to cut back on her fun stuff for December. She likes to have a spa day with her mom, for example. I said that I wasn't responsible for my computer being broken and that she 100% was. She said it was an accident and that I should forgive her. I said I wasn't upset, but that if she felt I should forgive her, then I fully forgive her, but she still has to help me pay for a new laptop. Am I the jerk? I did not just take her money. We talked about it first. She is still upset that I expect her to take responsibility. I did not make an unfair decision. We do not work that way. I think you are a bit of a jerk. She's a stay-at-home parent. She does not earn money that can be saved up for things like spa days with her mother. She relies on those funds that are budgeted for personal fun. It feels to me like you're treating her like a kid. How would you feel if you accidentally broke something she valued and she insisted you pay for it? If she had broken it intentionally, it would be one thing, but it was an accident and she was trying to be helpful by cleaning your office. It really does sound like a jerk move to me. You're the jerk. You sound like you're punishing a kid by withholding their allowance not talking with your wife. Grow up. Stuff happens. You're in a marriage and a partnership. Don't pretend you didn't take her money and aren't a jerk. That's exactly what you are. You didn't talk about it and mutually agree. She clearly does not agree. At best, you bullied her into giving into your childish and petty demands. Enjoy those Legos. They're going to cost you way more than a few hundred bucks. You're the jerk. Stop treating your wife like a kid. What on earth? If losing $250 is not going to affect your life, then what's the point of treating your wife like this? Like honestly, this seems like a misuse of power. I'd bet money that losing $250 means more to your wife than it does to you. Just wow. Sometimes people can be so trash. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. 
New job, bait and switch. I worked for a national home improvement store, the blue one. When I interviewed, I applied for the sales position in plumbing, no longer exists. It was Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, with a commission program. Since I had years of plumbing experience, I was offered the job. The day I started, I was told the sales job went to an internal promotion. Only thing they could offer me was part-time, lower hourly rate, no commission, had to work alternating weekends. I was young and had a new baby, so I said sure, as long as I could go full-time in a few months with weekends off. My manager agreed. Fast forward three months, not a word has been said. The guy who got the sales job, an electrician, asked me questions about plumbing all day. I asked my department manager about full-time, a sales job, anything. Sorry, nothing available. I reminded him of what I was hired for, the schedule I was promised, the pay I was originally offered. DM, if you don't like it, look for another job. Jobs at the time were hard to come by, but a job that was available, in that store even, was a stocking job. This position was always available as the pay wasn't great and it was a lot of physical work, but the hours were Monday through Friday full time, so I applied for that. When I interviewed, my manager found out. He went to HR to stop me from transferring. I informed HR that if the position didn't get filled and I was excluded from transferring, I would filter a complaint, so I got the job. Fast forward two months and the quarter ends. No actual plumber in the department meant sales dropped so manager didn't get his bonus. He now begs me to come back. No thanks, I'm making more money on Saturday doing side jobs than I made Monday through Friday. So he asks, what can I do to get you back in plumbing? I give him a ridiculous price. He laughs and says, that's more than I make. Oh well. Fast forward three more months, store manager doesn't get her bonus because plumbing hasn't made budget in two quarters in a row. Time to fix the problem. I get called into a meeting with store manager and department manager. Store manager, what will it take to get you back in plumbing? Me, stupid salary. DM, I told you, not reasonable. Store manager, give us a minute please. I stand up to leave and store manager, oh no, I'm sorry, I meant department manager should leave. Department manager, surprised Pikachu face. Store manager, if I pay you that, you'll have to work weekends. We're busiest on weekends. Me. I'll do Saturday. With every Sunday and Monday off. No rotating days off like before. I get my commission back. Store manager. Done. You cannot talk about your rate. I'm the only person in the store making more than this. Me. Well, I can, but I won't. The look on department manager's face when we came out was priceless. If he had only given me the job I was hired for originally. But I am the manager. I'm the AGM at a recently opened hotel in my city. I wear the fancy suit, have the fancy name tag, it's magnetic, and definitely don't look like a guest staying there. But I'm also the only member of the team who wears a suit over a generic uniform. We had a woman, I'm estimating mid to late 60s, come in and was snooping around, so needless to say, I approached to ask if I could help her. She said she was just wanting to see the pool. I explained that our pool is closed and still under construction. The door next to the pool itself is blocked off with a coming soon sign. Lady, I saw that online, but I just wanted to see it. You know how sometimes things say one thing online and another in person? Hotels really don't keep up on that stuff. Me, I'm aware that this is sometimes the case, but I assure you, madam, the pool is closed and still under construction. We're excited and hopeful to see it open in January. Lady, is there someone I can talk to? I really want to take my granddaughter here over Christmas to use the pool. Me. I'm the AGM here actually, and unfortunately, as I said, the pool isn't expected to be open until the new year. There literally, physically, is no pool right now. Lady goes up to the FDA and asks about the pool and booking to use it over Christmas. FDA says, slightly confused, as my manager, gestures to me, explained, the pool won't be open. Lady looks back at me, then back at FDA. Is there a manager I can speak to? Again, my name tag literally says manager in fun bold letters. Me. Madam, I am the assistant general manager, and in fact, the current acting general manager. The actual general manager was away aiding with another property opening. Lady looks at the FDA. I just don't understand. Why can't I speak to the manager? Me and FDA exchange a confused look. Me. 
Madam, I assure you, I am the only manager on the property. Lady, I can't believe this. I want to speak to a manager. Me again. I am the manager. I said I want to speak to the manager. Me again, more forcefully. Madam, I am the manager. I'm the one you want to speak to. Lady turns to front desk agent. Call the manager right now. This service is so unacceptable. I just want to bring my granddaughter to use the pool over Christmas. Me. Madam, again, I am the manager. And as I've repeatedly told you, we do not have a pool that will be available over Christmas. There is no pool. Lady gets angrier. Why didn't you just say that? It says you have a pool online. This is not acceptable. I'm going to speak to the manager and get you all fired. Me. At this point, I'm Ryle Reynolds done with this. Sure, please do. I'll be more than happy to fire myself, then collect severance for unlawful termination. It will make for a great Christmas bonus. I'll take my wife and kid to Fiji. Lady, red in the face. Your manager will hear from me. How dare you ruin my granddaughter's Christmas. I'll make sure to tell everyone you won't let anyone use your pool. The lady then stormed out. I recognize the lady may be in her early stages of something serious, but in the entire interaction, she was very clear-minded. I don't think I've ever had anyone so forcefully deny my existence like this before. Am I the jerk for watching TV while my daughter eats dinner? I have a two-year-old daughter. Most days, my wife feeds her breakfast, I feed her dinner. She mostly feeds herself, but we watch her to make sure she doesn't spill stuff all over or if she has any requests. I love my daughter. I would like that to be clear. She's my favorite person in the world. I spend a ton of time every day horsing around with her, teaching her letters and numbers, reading books. I put her to bed every other night, brush her teeth, etc. I spend a lot of quality time with her in my opinion. However, she is very boring to watch eat. It takes her about 30 minutes, what amounts to maybe one and a half cups of food and drink her milk. She spends about half the time playing with her fork, singing the alphabet, or blathering nonsense. We are also trying to be mindful of using electronics around or in front of her. In particular, no phones at the dinner table. About a week ago, I was preparing dinner with my AirPods in and realized that I could continue listening to music and podcasts while I was watching her eat, to make it at least a little more interesting. The other day, I decided to stick my phone in the napkin holder on the table so my daughter couldn't see it and watch Netflix. I thought this was genius. I only have one AirPod in so I can still hear everything she says. I still am keeping an eye on her. I'm still sitting in front of her, looking in her general direction, but I'm watching TV. Now, instead of dreading dinner time, I'm fine with it. Anyway, yesterday, my wife came home with my mother-in-law and caught me watching TV. When she came in, I pointed to the AirPod, then to the phone and gave a thumbs up, thinking she too would think I'm a genius. Well, my wife's not happy. I'm not sure if it's her or it's her mom who was really not happy, but she thinks I should be spending that time with my daughter. I think I am. I think my daughter is completely unaware that I'm watching TV. So no harm, no foul. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk, slightly. Dinner time shouldn't be essentially a solitary experience where you're at the table with family. At two, not everything she says is blathering nonsense. Most parents would use this time with the kid to encourage discussion about the food, about the day, whatever. It's not too young to teach her about socializing over a meal. And we're talking about half an hour for you. Make an effort here. I kind of sympathize with OP, but this is what you signed up for when you have a kid. Perhaps something more interactive could help. Like, for example, if you feel bored watching her eat, maybe you can read both of you guys a story while she eats. That way it's more of an interactive experience and you won't be too bored. Maybe you can make up a story yourself and tell it, etc. Talk to your kid while they're eating. Open up a conversation, albeit mostly one-sided. Show interest in your kid. Quality time. You're the jerk. Your daughter is interacting, watching your facial expressions, talking to you, and eating. Yes, it is the most boring thing ever, but your being part of it is important for her development. Not the jerk at all. Single mom of a two and a half year old. Having her chatter to herself while eating is completely normal and she would be doing the exact same thing if she was at nursery. If you're spending quality time with her during the day, you've met her needs and for that period of time, you can meet your own. These comments are absolutely absurd. I spend all day either caring for my little one or at work. When it gets to dinner time is the only time I can get some uninterrupted studying time. 
Some people think dinner time is the most sacred thing in the world because they spend so much time away from their family for the majority of the day, but for many, it can be the opposite. You're the jerk for making a post and then arguing with everyone because you don't like the judgment. Meal times are great times to interact with your kid. And yes, I do realize they go on about all kinds of nonsense. I have a two and a half year old who plays really well independently, but there are certain times where giving them your attention matters. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for calling my husband selfish for not lending my family money to be able to afford Christmas? I'm female, 25, and my family is huge. Holiday time is when they all gather together and have a huge celebration. Unfortunately, mom and dad got into medical debt and lost money on multiple surgeries in the past few months. As a result, they said they could not afford to have a decent Christmas celebration, which is devastating since all of our relatives wanted to come celebrate both Christmas and their health improvements. Dad came up with a suggestion to borrow money, $3,000, from my husband, male 32. My husband's family are well off, but my husband is dependent on himself and rarely asks them for help. He has a savings account to start investing in the land his father left him. He's been saving for three years now. I brought up my dad's suggestion to my husband and he refused, saying he didn't have that kind of money. But I pointed out how he has a savings account with over $7,000. But he said sorry, but he needed it to fix and invest in the land to be able to change his job and work less hours because the land will be a source of income once he invests in it. He said my family doesn't need to have a fancy celebration and instead they can have one that can fit their budget. I explained that we're a huge family with many kids and the money will go towards them. He told me he wasn't willing to waste his money on a ridiculous cause. I got upset and told him that he'll get his money back, but he pointed out basically how my parents are still struggling with medical debt and questioned their ability to return the $3,000. We argued and I ended up calling him selfish and cruel for refusing to help while having the means to. He said he didn't owe anybody anything, then walked out of the room. I stopped talking to him and now he thinks I'm being the cruel one for not seeing how important his dad's land is for him to get fixed and invested in. Info, my dad didn't ask family to chip in with money because he felt it might be rude and inappropriate to ask my family to pay and it'll make it look like he's basically charging them to attend. Info, I can't help because I'm a student and I have no income. Not the jerk. Christmas doesn't have to be a big to-do. The important part is about having family around. Homemade gifts such as batches of cookies or a homemade ornament are just as valid a gift as a purchased gift that can be a lot more expensive. I know where you and your husband are both coming from. You're looking at short term how to help your family, but your husband is looking at the future and how to make a change that will also benefit your family with him that does require quite a bit of money to implement. It would be great if he could help out your family. But he has said no and established a valid reason for why he can't, with good reason. This medical debt doesn't sound like it's going away anytime soon and there's no guarantee of repayment, which means the future plan would have to go on the back burner and potentially not happen at all. It's fine that you asked, but your husband has said no. He doesn't feel comfortable with it, so if you want to help, it's best to try to find another way. I don't see any jerks here. You obviously care about your parents and want to help them and that is admirable. The money your husband has saved is his money, and it does not sound like your parents have a way to pay him back. And if they don't pay it back, that's going to cause some issues. It is a really bad idea to loan family and friends money unless you really do not care whether or not they pay it back, because there is no guarantee. Even if someone has the means to repay, they could lose their job, have a medical emergency, etc. Instead of continuing to argue with your husband about this, maybe try to find a new solution. Maybe pull the relatives together and have them all contribute in a way. Point out that due to the health issues, they cannot afford the same celebration and as a way to support them and help them celebrate, you want to invite everyone who is willing and able to chip in. Maybe everyone can bring a dish and maybe draw names and pick a kid to get a gift for. And tell your parents that you and your husband do not have the funds available to loan them, but that you are willing to help out in other ways and then get with the family and come up with a plan. If you have this large family that cares about your parents and really wants to celebrate, they should all be happy to chip in. Not the jerk. My husband knows better than to tell me no when I tell him I need money. Honestly, your husband sounds like a total money hoarder. Nobody just needs $7,000 sitting in a savings account. Six-month emergency fund is all anyone needs in savings. Everything else is fair play, and the fact that he doesn't even care about your family is a huge red flag. 
Hopefully you can divorce this rich boy soon and half of that account should automatically go to you. When I got divorced from my jerk ex-husband, I was able to get equity in the house even though he bought it before we met. Check if you live in a marital property state like I do and as long as you get a good lawyer, you'll be able to take this idiot to the cleaners. Good luck, sis. You deserve so much better. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Never loan money to friends or family. You won't get it back. Small business client goes no contact after my uncle makes her a website, so he shuts down her site. Okay, so to start, my uncle has been a competent programmer for many years, at least since the earliest 2000s, and even coded a system for his company once, so it's safe to say that he's one smart cookie. But one person thought she was smarter than him and that she would do him out of a website, so my uncle got back at her. My uncle sometimes does odd jobs for clients as a sort of side hustle, making websites, debugging, and or creating software, retrieving data that an intern misplaced, etc. On one of these jobs, he gets a woman that has her own small business. If I remember correctly, he told me that she sold beauty products and cosmetics like perfume, cologne, makeup, etc. She wants her website to have all the bells and whistles, so instead of going to one of those websites that lets you build one yourself, she decides to get him to do it because of his programming knowledge. So he makes her website and includes just about everything, links to various social media, the ability to make an account on the website, subscription services, everything. But after giving it to her server, she locked him out and not only ghosted him, but also blocked him on her personal and business phones. So it's clear that she had no intention of paying him the whole thing. Cue the pro revenge. So two things I should mention. One, my uncle had her sign a contract which stated she would pay one-fourth the whole price in a lump sum, which she did. Two, the contract stated she would pay in monthly installments, roughly 30 days, and promised repercussions legal or otherwise for non-payment. So my uncle waits the 30 days, no payment. So he figures he should make due on his portion of the contract. Inside the code of the website is a code snippet which essentially checks a variable, payment, every 24 hours. And if it's false, the opacity is decreased little by little. But if it's true, then the entire opacity is restored. So basically, if my uncle didn't manually change it from his computer, the screen would just be white. She eventually calls him and threatens to sue him for sabotaging her business. My uncle reminds her that she signed a contract with a witness and legal counsel present, so it would be cheaper to just pay him. She instead did decide to try and sue him, but in court, it was an open and shut case since she signed the contract and she was ordered to pay the rest in a lump sum, which put her in trouble because it ate away at most of her business profits. Karen stole my cookbook, so now I'm suing her. My family is originally from a country with a very distinct style of cooking that is hard to replicate in the States. Growing up, my mom always did the cooking for big family events and at home for the immediate family, so her cooking was a huge part of my childhood. For one of my birthdays, I asked her for a cookbook of as many of the recipes as she could remember. So I have this handwritten journal full of my favorite childhood recipes. This cookbook has a lot of sentimental value to me, especially since my mother passed away shortly after. My cousin has been pestering me about borrowing the cookbook for years. She claims it's fair because my mother's cooking was just as much a part of her childhood as mine. She feels this way because her own mother was neglectful and her dad was absent, so my mom was often a mother figure to her, and in all honesty, her only parent-like figure. She spent some time living with us, and she sometimes called my mom, Mom. I've offered to let her take pictures or scan it. She says it would take too long and wouldn't mean as much as the real thing. The reason I'm against her just taking it is because my cousin is a messy and clumsy person, especially in the kitchen. I've never seen her cook a meal without causing some huge mess or spill. This scares me because the cookbook is not laminated or protected in any way. It's just paper and pencil. I had the family over for Thanksgiving and realized the morning after that my cookbook was gone. I immediately sent my cousin multiple texts because I knew it was her, but didn't get an answer. So today I went over in person. She answers the door and immediately starts crying and justifying herself. She spilled tomato sauce all over the book and then soaked it trying to clean it up in tomato sauce. Most of the pages are pretty much destroyed and illegible. Nobody else in the family knows all those recipes. I feel like I've lost a part of my mother and a part of my childhood. 
I plan to pursue legal action. The family has caught wind of this and I've received a flurry of messages calling me the jerk and various other names, saying how I'm ruining the family over a book and a mistake, etc. I really empathize with her grief over my mom and I know they had a close relationship. I also understand that she didn't spill on the book intentionally and that she feels bad about it. I don't think that justifies her stealing and ruining something with that level of sentimental value to me, especially after I said no, gave reasoning for the no, and offered alternatives. So Reddit, would I be the jerk if I sue? I'm saying not the jerk, because your cousin clearly shouldn't have stolen the cookbook and ruined it, but I don't understand what you would get out of a lawsuit. You're the jerk. You're seriously going to sue your cousin over a cookbook? Chances are you have tons of things that belong to your mom. There's no need to be stingy with a cookbook, and if you had just been kind and given it to her, then you wouldn't even be in this situation. Well, what do you think? Should OP sue her cousin or not? Please let us know. I'd do a lot more than just sue, to be honest. I told a customer her daughter bullied me back in high school. So I work at a department store in a mall near where I grew up. I was bullied in high school. I don't think about it a lot, but sometimes people from high school come through my store. I just do my job and I'm pleasant to them because I need the money. Anyway, a woman came through to pick up an order and she gave me the last name and spelled it. I thought, hey, that's Kristen and Katie's last name from high school. It was a pretty unique name. I didn't say anything at first, just normal pleasant chatter. She took the stuff out of the bag to make sure it was right and commented, my daughters will love these, they just finished college, etc. She essentially confirmed whose mom she was. I was just making small talk and said, oh, I think I went to school with a Kristen and Katie last name. She said, oh yeah, how funny. Were you friends? I said, oh no, I just knew they were in my grade. She said, were you on the volleyball team with them? I said, no, I don't think so. She looked at my name tag and said, that's odd. I think I remember them talking about a penny back then. You must have come over for their birthday or something. That just kind of made me sad because I've never been to a birthday party before. And I said, no, I definitely never came over. Kristen bullied me and I don't think I ever talked to Katie. Her entire demeanor changed, which was okay, honestly. I had people in line. She didn't say a single thing after that and just kind of left without taking her order sheet. I didn't chase her down to get it to her. She'll have a copy in her email anyway. The next customer in line said something like, Phew, that was awkward. And my coworker at the counter agreed. They both laughed about it, but later on my coworker said it was pretty rude of me to tell the woman that her kid was a bully. She has a daughter. I don't have kids. I have a betta fish named Carl. On the one hand, yeah, I guess. It was like four years ago. But at the same time, it happened. And I think a parent would want to know that their kid was a jerk to others so they could talk to them about it. Even as adults. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. You brought the connection up. What did you think was going to happen? She didn't know who you were. Her daughters probably never mentioned you. She was trying to be polite to someone who seemed to know her family. This entire interaction wouldn't have happened if you hadn't forced it. What? Did you think you would tell their mother how awful her daughter was and she would tearfully beg your forgiveness and call your ex bully on the phone in front of you and disown her for her crimes? You put this woman who just wanted to do her shopping in peace in an uncomfortable position for no reason. It seems I'm going against the grain here, but you're the jerk. Obviously, the daughters are jerks for the bullying, but they're not part of this story. This is an interaction between you, who works in customer service, and their mother, a paying customer who didn't bully you in high school. As part of your job, you usually have to make small talk as you complete the sale. But you recognized her. She didn't recognize you. You were the one to bring up knowing her daughters, and being asked how you know them was bound to be the next question. You may have answered honestly, but there was always the option you didn't take. Say nothing in the first place. Take her money, let her leave with her shopping, and forget about it. Instead, you went with the nuclear option. I noticed in another comment someone said you were unprofessional. This is what they mean. For minimum wage in retail, professional means you say, have a nice day, and then shut up. You've probably embarrassed a customer into not coming back, and you're lucky your management didn't overhear the conversation. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for what she said or not? Please let us know. I'd be proud if I found out my kids were bullies. Karen ruined my $20,000 coat 
so I'm suing her. I, 28 female, have a niece who's 16. She's my only sister's only child. Two years ago, I married a very wealthy man who's 34, and because of the lockdown, last Christmas was my first with my in-laws. My mother-in-law gifted me a coat that is worth more than $20,000. I saw her wearing it, asked her where she bought it, and she said that it would be my Christmas gift from her. I didn't know how much it was. I knew it was expensive, but I thought maybe $3,000 at the most. I was visiting my sister last January when my niece saw it. She googled the brand and showed me how much it really was. I won't lie, I didn't wear it after that because I was afraid of ruining it. Last week, I wore it while visiting my sister. While I was putting it back on to leave, I felt something go splat on my back. Then my niece started cackling and the smell of paint hit me. I was so ticked off while she was not apologetic at all. Her mom screamed at her and said she was grounded. Then she said she will pay for the dry cleaning. While I was in my car, still in shock by the way, I got an alert that my niece posted a reel. It was of her doing a prank on me and she said, I'm going to hit my aunt's $20,000 coat with a paint-filled balloon to see how she reacts. I saved it on my phone, sent it to her mom, and told her that a week's grounding is not enough. She didn't reply, but I saw that my niece took it down. It got less than 5 views by then. The next day, I found out my coat cannot be saved, so I called my sister and told her that her daughter has to pay it back. Well, we got into an argument, and then she said that they will not be paying it, and if I wanted a new one, I should get my husband to buy it for me. I think that they should pay for it. They can afford to. In my opinion, they should sell my niece's car and pay me back my money. We did not reach an agreement, so I told her that I will be suing, and I reminded her that I have video evidence that her daughter, A, did it on purpose for online clout, and B, knew exactly how expensive it was. People in my life are not objective at all. I have some calling me a jerk, some saying that they are the jerks for not buying me a new one, and some so obsessed with the price of the coat that they're calling me a jerk for simply owning it and wanting a new one. So, am I the jerk? Edit. Sorry for not making it clear, but my coat was bought new, just identical to my mother-in-law's. Not the jerk. She ruined a $20,000 coat. She wasn't even apologetic. Not the jerk. This is a really good way for your niece to learn that actions have consequences, and hopefully will serve her well in the future when she's older. And your sister seems to need that lesson too. Sounds like just have your husband buy you a new one is not an appropriate reaction to your kid destroying a $20,000 item. Honestly, not the jerk. Actions have consequences and you're right, a week's grounding isn't enough. She should sell her car and cough up the money. The niece is old enough to know better. Tell your sister either she comes up with the money or you take it to the cops. I wonder if a police report will force the insurance company to come up with the money. This wasn't an accident, it was intentional and she won't do it again. This reminds me of the idiots gluing themselves to paintings to fight climate change. $20,000 is an exorbitant amount of money for a jacket. How sad to live in a capitalistic society where we put such high value on one piece of clothing. Maybe these types of things just shouldn't exist. You're the jerk. I won't try to justify her actions. They were clearly wrong and there should be some form of restitution that is made, but suing her is a nuclear option. Think about what you're trading here. You will spend the rest of your life having little to no contact with your only sister and only niece. Holidays, birthdays, graduations, weddings, etc. will all be awkward. That is, if you're even invited. And for what? A piece of fabric? Doesn't seem like a good trade to me. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for wanting to sue her niece or not? Please let us know. Not at all. You can't just let your kid ruin someone's $20,000 item and expect to not have to pay for it. Break the law? Sure thing, boss. Sign here, please. I used to work as a spare parts estimator for a fairly niche industry. My job was essentially to work out what parts of our main product the customer wanted, find out how much it would cost us to make, add a little markup, and send them a quote. My boss was pretty strict on traceability, so everything needed to be recorded, including why a certain markup had been applied to a particular product. Normal value of these quotes is somewhere between 200 pounds and a few hundred thousand. Very rarely do we get orders for anything more than that, once or twice a decade in my experience. A request for quotation landed on my desk when I was working from home during lockdown, and it was a biggie. Just looking at the list of parts the customer wanted, this was going to be a giant order, over a million pounds all by itself. 
I was told by the sales guy that if this one went well, there was another to follow of an even bigger size, ultimately looking at 10 million over the next four years. So I set to work. Normally, I can do five or six of these quotes in a day, but this one quote took me six weeks to put together. I was in constant contact with 20 plus vendors getting specifications, technical details, prices, and lead times for over 400 items. Finally, my masterpiece was complete. Then came the snag. Sales guy then says that because of the country the customer is in, they need to have four or more quotes in from different customers in order to get it cleared by their government, some anti-corruption policy that had been instituted. We were the OEM of the product and there's nowhere else on the planet that they could get these parts from. So we'd have to work through third parties to get it done, and he knew just the guy. In walks a one-man band with a dodgy-looking entry to save the day. Sales guy and him go way back, so he was going to be the preferential supplier. I was asked to do the normal quote to him, then to bump the prices up by 30% and send that to three other companies who had been asking about it so they could absolutely not get the contract with the end user. I argued the point saying that the whole purpose of the anti-corruption policy is to prevent situations exactly like this, but I was overruled. The COO of the company now tells me to just do it over a phone call, at which point I request that in writing, before I go ahead and do it. Fast forward two years and there's still no order that's been placed. Then I find out through a different sales guy that the one-man band has been put on a blacklist by this company's government over this project. The other three companies have been turned down and the end user is asking other companies to come in and take our product out and replace it with their own. A huge investigation is called for by senior management. My quote is ripped to pieces and examined in microscopic detail, and the question gets asked, why did you give different prices to these other three when you knew it was all to do with anti-corruption? We should fire you. That's millions of pounds of order you've lost us. Out comes the email from my little black book. On the desk it goes, Everyone suddenly gets very quiet and the COO starts packing his desk in a box the next week. And the moral of the story is, if someone tells you to do something borderline illegal, make sure to get it in writing. For those asking about the legality of what I did, because all of the third parties were outside of the country where the anti-corruption policy was in place, I didn't personally break any laws. Whilst the anti-corruption policies are in place for the end user, the worst the government can do is put us on a blacklist so all of our bids in the future are either refused outright or looked at in far more detail than others might be. I did investigate this at the time, and if there were going to be any implications on me that my company wouldn't have been responsible for, it would have been a flat no. I was acting against the intention of the policy, but not expressly breaking it. Do not do something illegal just because your boss told you to. The issue as far as the company was concerned was the lost millions in revenue and the damage to their reputation. The end user is a huge company with contracts and is in a reasonably close-knit industry. People talk. They ultimately wanted a scapegoat to parade in front of the board to explain why the multi-million pound deal they had all been talking about for the last two years had suddenly vanished. I did also look at OEM Angle at the time, but because we aren't the only company who make this type of product, it didn't appear to be possible to use this as an exception. The reasoning being that the option existed to replace our system with the competitors. Would I be the jerk if I don't allow my daughter to come with the family on vacation? I have five kids, three with my first wife, a daughter who's 22, a son who's 16, and a daughter who's 16, and two with my current wife, eight, a son, and six, another son. We are planning a two-week trip to the Dominican Republic in spring of next year. My wife and I are paying for the four youngest, obviously, but as my daughter is an adult with a full-time job, I expected her to pay for her own part of the trip. This is by far the most expensive holiday we've ever been on, and we've been saving up for it for a couple of years. She only pays £300 per month for rent and utilities at her mom's house and shouldn't have any other large expenses as her car has been paid off for a year. When I told her she would be paying most of her own trip, she initially agreed and didn't have a problem with it. A week ago, I was confirming dates and prices with her before I booked and she decided that she no longer wanted to pay for the trip. I only wanted her to pay £1,400 for the trip, about 600 less than the price per person. I understand it's expensive for a young adult, but she had previously agreed knowing this is what I would expect her to pay and said she was saving for the trip. I also told her she didn't need to pay me all in one go, but that I needed at least £700 from her before I booked the trip 
and she could pay the rest within a year. I think this is reasonable. I've put off booking the holiday for the time being in the hopes that she'll come around. I've told her that if she doesn't agree to pay, then the rest of the family will go without her and she'll miss out. She thinks it's unfair that she has to pay when I'm paying for the rest of the kids, their children. She pointed out we never went on a vacation like this when she was still a kid. We mostly did caravan holidays in the UK and France, and I'm therefore giving her siblings experiences she never got. She also says her friend's parents still pay for them to go on holiday with their family. My younger daughter is also upset about the possibility of going without her sister and says it will ruin the holiday for her. My ex-wife also thinks I'm being unreasonable, as she agrees with our daughter about her not having the same experiences as the younger kids do because we had less money when she was younger. My daughter's stepdad has offered to pay me the initial 700 pounds, but I feel weird about taking money from him. As an adult, I really think my daughter should take on the responsibility for paying for herself, but would I be the jerk if I don't let her come if she continues to refuse? Edit. I'm paying around 11,000 for this trip, which is roughly a quarter of my yearly income. I wanted my daughter to pay 1,400 pounds, which is maybe 6% of her yearly income. And yes, she does only have minimal expenses. 300 for rent is nothing where we live, and she couldn't rent a bed sit for double the price. A large percentage of her income is disposable, and she saves lots living at home. Bear in mind, I have a mortgage, soaring electric and gas bills, as well as four kids to provide for. She's had nine months to save 700, but didn't even need to because she already had more than 700 saved nine months ago. She now has another year to get me the other 700, and I had no plans about being strict about payback. This summer, she went with friends for a few days to Disneyland Paris. I paid 300 pounds towards this trip as a birthday gift for her. This summer, when we went on a cheap holiday to Cornwall, I paid for all of her expenses then. My daughter helped plan this trip from the start, and we chose almost every aspect as a family, and she knew from the start how much I expected her to cover for this holiday. If she had said this didn't work for her, I could have picked a different and cheaper holiday. The assumption that my daughter is regularly being treated unfairly to her siblings is not accurate. When I was her age, I was already her father and working two jobs, happily, to provide a good quality of life for my daughter and her mother. I'm happy that my daughter's young adult life is more carefree than mine got to be. If she was struggling financially, or even just living on her own paying rent and bills, I would never ask her to pay this much for a trip. And yeah, I have weird feelings about my daughter's stepdad for always refusing to be the bad guy and let our daughter learn to be more responsible. You're the jerk. So you'll pay for the kids that have no bills, but not the adult who is just starting out and is struggling to get her crap together? Look, if she was spending that much of her own money, more than two months rent, to go on a vacation with her friends, it would be irresponsible. Why on earth is it okay for her to spend it to go with family? Most kids that age don't even really want to go on vacation with their parents and little siblings. You're the jerk. 22 is young to be funding an overseas trip. If she never got a trip when she was younger, you have the money now, and you're paying for everyone else. Take the kid. My parents took my husband and I on a Mediterranean cruise in our late 20s because we never traveled growing up. They covered airfare and all of the fees. We only had to cover excursions and souvenirs. Do you want a family vacation or not? Um, you're the jerk. During the whole time she was growing up, she was unable to enjoy anything like this. The money wasn't there and she couldn't go. Now that the money is there, you're going to pay for everyone else to go, but you're going to expect her to pay for her own share of the vacation. Yeah, you're the jerk. I understand there was a conversation about it, but the fact that you would even have that expectation of her for something like this is pretty messed up. It's not like she's in her 30s with some great career. She's 22. At the very least, you can get over it and pay for one vacation for her. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for asking his 22-year-old daughter to pay for her vacation or not? Please let us know. Reddit be like, they're 18, they're an adult, they can do what they want. But then Reddit be like, she's only 22, you should pay for her vacation. You want HR involved? Okay, sure. I work in radiology. About 15 years ago, I was working with a radiographer, x-ray tech, called Smith. Now, Smith had recently received two official warnings of duty, one for mistreating the boss and one for mistreating me. Smith was told to change their attitude and behave. Smith, however, went on a path of revenge that was endless. A thousand tiny paper cuts for me. Nothing terrible, 
but just lots of little things which I knew Smith had done but I couldn't prove. One Monday morning, one of the A&E doctors came over to complain about how poor the x-ray image quality was a couple of nights ago. Smith goes over the roster board and sees my name corresponding to that shift. You work this afternoon shift by yourself. Smith charges into the boss's office, demanding a full complaint process. Smith demands, since clearly the boss and I have it in for them, HR should run it independently. The boss tries to talk Smith out of it, but Smith basically says they don't trust the boss to deal with me fairly. The boss tells Smith he will hand it over, but be careful of what you ask for. Apparently, Smith was in quite a lather and so excited that they had got me. Two days later, I'm being interviewed by two HR guys and an independent chief radiographer from another hospital. We go through each of the images and I agree the work is really poor. It's clear no one has actually looked too carefully at the paperwork with the x-ray images. The HR guy finally asks, why did you do such poor work? I reply, I didn't, and if they bothered to look at the online pay system, I had called in sick that day. In fact, Smith had done the overtime shift. They looked stunned. I reminded them I expected the same process for Smith. I also lodged an official complaint about false allegations that were made by Smith for this case. Apparently, Smith tried to stick to the roster, but they showed Smith their pay slip plus that they had signed off on all the other images. While HR was deciding what to do with Smith, fire them or not, Smith had two more incidents at work and was eventually fired. Edit, to answer some of your questions. 1. When Smith got fired, HR went to town and dug up every little bit of dirt on him so they couldn't claim wrongful dismissal. My boss was well aware of who worked and was happy to deal with it, but Smith wanted HR. My boss was more than happy to see Smith dig themselves an almighty hole. Did Smith take bad x-rays on purpose? I don't think so. I think Smith's mental health was crashing at this point. The work reflected their mental health. I think Smith saw the complaint and was quite manic and thought that they'd get me. Smith simply had overlooked the overtime that they did. Unsuitable Background I'm in Australia. I'm currently a 32-year-old male and this occurred this year. I used to do admin work in defense, and during that time I got rather qualified and experienced, specifically in people management and training people. I then left the uniform for various reasons, including depression caused by my time there. I got a new job, and intentionally got a position way below my capabilities so I could focus on my mental health while still working. It was a hotline for a government assistance program. The position was good for about four years. Over that time, I started using some of my skills more and built up my confidence again. I also was acting in higher positions almost the entire time. Initiating incident. So after all of the lockdowns finally finished, there was a permanent spot and a higher position available. By this time, I was the longest serving person remaining in the team and I was the most qualified. I knew they planned on getting the incumbent to do two roles, both of which I knew thoroughly. Went through the interview process, answered all of the questions, explained how I could do the role immediately without training, etc. Had to wait a few weeks to find out the results since it's still government and they don't do these things super fast. Then I got told that I was found not suitable. I was floored. I asked for an explanation and all I was told is that it was a very competitive round. When I asked what I could have done to be more competitive, I got the same answer. To make things worse, they asked me to train the guy who got the role. Immediately, I brought up the duty statement, which had the list of tasks for my role. Remember, it's super easy. Basically, just answer the phone and reply to emails. I also got out of public service level expectations and highlighted the appropriate bits for my level. Cue malicious compliance. Since I wasn't suitable to work at higher levels, I immediately stopped all work that wasn't at my level or in my job description. To say this put a dent into the extra work I was doing would be an understatement. I used to help out management with sorting out interpersonal disputes. I used to run a bunch of reports to find and sort out work that was missed, and I used to help the other teams do their work. So at this point, my days became super easy. I would do about 10% of what I used to, as that 10% was my actual job. The training I was doing was directing the guy to the procedures, and if he had questions, directing him to ask a supervisor. It was about a week of this before management noticed the training wasn't very in-depth. One by one, they asked me what was going on. Our structure had six supervisors at the time, each and every time I said the same thing. Unfortunately, I was found unsuitable for the role, 
so I can't teach someone how to do it. To say they were upset would be an understatement, but they tried to stay professional. They then started questioning why I stopped doing all the extra work that I had been doing for years. I directed their attention to my duty statement and asked where it lists that work. They said the extra duties as directed. I then asked how that aligns with the level expectations, which are surprisingly clear and helpful. At this point, most stopped trying. During all of this sudden free time I had, I started searching for a new job. It only took me two weeks to go for interviews, be found suitable, and got a new job. Apparently, I'm incredibly competitive at this level. Who knew? The fallout. The new job is significantly easier at the level I was unsuitable for and gives me much more money than they were offering. Additionally, I've kept in touch with some people there. The management are floundering as interpersonal problems are cropping up. The team can't keep up the workload and at least three more people have gotten new jobs with at least two looking for other employment, leaving one person left in the hotline team that will know what they're doing. It's a shame really because I liked that program and probably would have stayed for a long time. Am I the jerk for my response when my family asked me about having kids? I'm 22, female, and I come from a traditional family. By that, I mean every woman in my family had at least one kid before they were 20. Education was never a priority. Because of this, I have four younger siblings and about a dozen cousins. Being the oldest, I had to be a second mother to my siblings and a babysitter for my cousins. This made me realize I never wanted to be a parent myself back when I was only 10. 12 years later and my opinion hasn't changed. I don't like kids and I don't want any. Last year I had my tubes tied and I didn't tell my family. They're trying to push the idea that I'm nothing and my life is empty without me having any kids. I've made my point clear many times but they kept pushing it. Last night we had a big family dinner and they again tried convincing me to have kids so I shut down everything they said in a not so nice way. They were going on and on about how amazing being a mom is and how that's their biggest accomplishment. So I reminded them of all of the times they've complained about having to take care of the kids. All the times they would yell at us for doing kids stuff. All the times they would tell us how much they regret having us and how we ruin their lives. I reminded one of my aunts of all the times she would make 10 year old me take care of her four kids who were all under six just because she was bored and sick of taking care of them herself. I reminded my dad of all the times he complained about how much more money he had to spend on me and my siblings. And of course, I reminded them how they kicked us out at 18 because they don't have to care for us legally speaking. Then I just said something like, all my life you've done nothing but complain about having kids and now you're sitting here telling me how kids are the best thing in the world? You're all hypocrites. Then I told them not to call me unless they decide to apologize for berating me and I left. They're all very mad at me, but my siblings and cousins say I should have made my point without making them feel like bad parents. So, am I the jerk? Update. My mom showed up at my apartment demanding that I make a formal apology to the family and went off on me for my behavior. Then she went on about how disappointed she is that she raised such a selfish excuse of a daughter. Then she left. So I sent the following message in the family group chat. I will not apologize for defending myself and standing my ground. I've put up with y'all for too long and I'm sick of having to justify my choices. I will live the way I see fit because it's my life. This so-called family never showed me any love or support. Even as a kid, I was just a free babysitter for your kids. I see you will never respect me or my decisions, so I don't see a reason for me to stay in contact with you. Do not contact me again. Oh, and by the way, I had my tubes tied a year ago. Goodbye. Then I blocked them all. Update 2. Mom showed up at my work because how dare I talk to my family that way and how dare I not give her grandkids. My boss had to call the police to have her removed because she was hysterical. I'm going to stay with my BFF for a while. I'm looking for a new apartment and a new job. My landlord was very understanding and she offered to help me move my things into storage before the 15th of January. My lease ends January 7th. She said she won't charge me any rent if I can move out by the 15th. She's amazing. My boss was also very understanding and offered to help me look for another job. I'm going to see a lawyer tomorrow to get a restraining order against my family members. I don't work for you specifically. A couple of years back, I worked for a very large resort style place. It was where some very, very wealthy people had vacation homes. This place was huge 
as it was basically its own town, and I happened to be in a small subsection of the largest apartment. Now, it's important to note that the uniforms my small team wore were completely different from the vast majority of people in this department because we were very specialized. We wore blue shirts and gray pants. Most of the rest of the department wore green shirts with khaki pants. Actually, I'm fairly certain that we were the only team other than the on-site EMTs who had blue uniforms. It was a big place, lots of employees, so most everyone in public-facing jobs were essentially color-coded. Anyways, it was literally my second to last day on the job and I had to go to the main office for the department because that's where we kept things that we didn't need all the time. Space was extremely limited in our office. I run inside, pick up the box that we need, and head back out to my vehicle. A lady who's wearing a green shirt walks up to me, and since I try to be a decent person, I smile and say hello. Lady. Oh, perfect. I need help taking a whole bunch of crap over to the banquet hall. Me, very clearly holding a heavy box that's labeled for my team. Uh, I'm on a tight schedule. Sorry. My team worked a very time-sensitive position. I'm talking down to the second sometimes. Lady. That can wait. I need help now. Me. I'm really sorry, but I need to get this to... I don't care. You need to help me. Me. Completely out of hoots to give. Not to be rude, but you aren't my supervisor, and my actual supervisor will tear me a new one if I don't get back to our office right now. Lady. I'm going to tell the head of the department about this. Me. Over my shoulder as I walk away. Go ahead. He's in his office right now. I just said hi to him. Anyways, I headed over to my office and pretty much forgot about the interaction because we were slammed that day and it was non-stop until we closed. The next day was my last day on the job, so I wasn't surprised to see the head of the department show up when my shift was almost over. He was a really good guy, one of the best upper management types I've ever met, and really made an effort to get to know everyone in his department. My supervisor and I greeted him and we chatted while I finished cleaning up my station. Department head, suddenly very grave. OP? I got a very concerning report about you yesterday. Me and my supervisor. What? Department head. Apparently, you refused to give assistance to this lady when she asked for it. Me. Oh yeah, I was bringing supplies from storage back here and didn't have time. She was kind of rude. Department head, grinning widely at his own joke. Well, in that case, I'm afraid that I'll have to let you go if you don't apologize to her. Me. I'm terribly sorry that it has to end this way, but I must stick to my principles. He laughed, shook my hand, and told me I could always count on him for a good reference while my supervisor cackled in the background. It wasn't a perfect job, but it was one of the better ones, and I'll always be a little sad that I had to move away. But at least it ended with a pretty good chuckle. Want me to come to class and present despite being ill? Okay. For context, this was before 2020, back in my early university years, aka 2018 to 2019. It started one Wednesday morning when I woke up feeling like complete and utter crap. This was a problem, as today I was scheduled to do my oral presentation along with other students in one of my classes, but I figured no way would I be wanting to come in sick. And by sick, when I looked in that mirror, I was so pale I looked dead. My nose looked like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. My eyes were so sunken in that they were in the back of my head, and I was sweating like heck from a high fever. Oh, and my throat felt like it was made of sandpaper. Yeah, no way was I going into the lecture hall looking like this. So I went through the normal procedures, submitting a temporary absent form, which meant for the absent to be valid, I needed to go to a walk-in clinic, joy, and call any professors or teachers' assistants to inform them of my absence. We have a lot of interactive stuff in lectures, that's also common courtesy, along with an email for a paper trail. My afternoon physics professor understood. My evening teaching assistant for earth sciences was cool with it. My morning chemistry professor? Either you stop lying and come in, or it's an automatic zero. I'm sorry? I've never missed one of your classes, even with a minor cold. But this? Okay, fine then. So I get up and my mom drives me in, as I didn't have my license yet. Long story, and she wasn't working that day. She's self-employed. She's worried about me, but I reassured her that I would only be about 20 minutes max. I get to the campus and walk in, heading to my lecture hall, and of course, looking like utter crap, stumbling because I'm also running a really high fever. I get a lot of weird looks, and some students even stop me to ask if I was okay. I recall responding with something like, I won't be if I'm late for class. 
When I do get to my lecture hall, I enter two minutes late. Professor sees me and goes, OP, about time. Get down here and start your presentation or it's a fail. Alrighty. I went up, plugged in my laptop to the projector, and released an almighty round of wet coughing. Now, my lecture mates are whispering to each other and Professor looks at me startled, but all I remember doing is looking right at the Professor, smiling and saying very hoarsely, Sorry, I'll get started. She quickly tried to send me on my way, but I say into the microphone, my voice sounding like a sick bear's, No, no, you said if I don't present, it's a zero. I can't fail 20% of my grade. So off I go, presenting with a hoarse voice, long, hacking, wet coughs, and with occasional almost throwing off. When I finished, I then turned to the professor and asked again into the mic, do you need me to stick around for the other presentations or can I go? I was on my way to the doctor's within five minutes and wouldn't you know, I had a serious case of the flu, something that the university did not want you to bring to campus because it could spread like wildfire. Needless to say, when I filed my full absence form with my doctor's note, I mentioned how my chemistry professor insisted upon me coming to class. I also included a screenshot of the email she sent me while I was being driven in which stated the same thing she told me over the phone. When I was finally able to return to campus a week later, I was surprised to enter a class to see a substitute professor. I later looked at my email and saw a class notification that our original professor was placed on leave. She was let go by the end of the term. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.